Church. I'm your brother Kasafo. I'm your brother Zekwa. Hope you all enjoying this Sabbath day and we hope you all had the opportunity also to watch the lessons honoring and understanding the heavenly parents and also the law class on honor your father and mother as these things go together with the series of lessons that we're going into here. Um Anything before we get started, Zachwa? No, I'm ready. All right. This lesson is a bit lengthy, comprehensive, if you will, unpacking a lot of things. So we appreciate your patience with us and hope this is helpful for understanding and edification and insight in the times to come and in what we need to do and what we need to be focused on for building ourselves and our families for the hope we have in Christ Yache. As a prerequisite to this lesson, please reference the lesson called Man, His Wife, and Christ to complement this lesson for understanding on growing a healthy relationship with your wife. Oh. Now, let's get started here with understanding a household first. Uh, let's look at where the foundation of a household starts. Can you read 1 Clement chapter 33, verse 5, please? For well, thus saith Elohim, let us make man after our image and after our likeness. And Elohim made man, male and female made he them. The father and the mother, with the Lord, as the beginning of their creation, made first male and female in their image. In the spiritual world, this was Christ in the church. Can you read Second Clement chapter 14, verse 2, please? And I do not suppose you're ignorant that the living church is the body of Christ. For the scripture saith, Allah made man, male and female. The male is Christ, and the female is the church. This helps understand that a family begins with a man getting his wife. Can you read Sirach chapter 36, verse 24, please? He that getteth a wife beginneth a possession, a help like unto himself, and a pillar of rest. Now, once he gets a wife, that's his possession, just for him from Allah He builds on that possession, leaving his parents to be with his wife, as taking care of his own house, to sacrifice himself to build up his wife, takes priority over his parents. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23, please. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. As in the spirit world, Christ is the head of his wife. In this world, man is the head of his wife. Continue, please. And he is the savior of the body. A man's sacrifice to become perfect in the faith saves his wife by Christ being formed in him so that he may please her by doing the will of the Lord, his Lord, Christ, in everything, being an example to his wife. Continue, please. Therefore, if the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. The obedience of a wife to a husband to please him in everything, as the church is unto Christ, is the unity that the name of Ahaya brings, and the Holy Spirit rejoices in, seeing them in agreement to walk in the same light of Christ. Can you read Sirach 25 and 1, please? In three things was I beautified, and stood up beautiful, both before Elohim and men. That's the Holy Spirit speaking of how she is beautified. Continue, please. The unity of brethren, the love of neighbors, a man and a wife that agreed together. That agreement comes with husbands loving their wives like Christ does his own. 
being righteous examples, to lead the house in the ways of Allah Hayyam, and wives submitting to their husbands in everything like the church does to hers, cleaving unto the righteousness of the husband, not putting her own perception of right and wrong above Allah Hayyam's. Continue, please. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. A man has to love his wife according to the love of Christ, to give himself to do the will of Allah Hayyam in everything, according to Allah Hayyam's words in the laws and testimonies as Christ did. By men focusing on that in simplicity, it will result in the cleansing of the wives. Can you continue reading in Ephesians 5 and 25, 26 to 28, please? That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. That's what men in Christ are going to do and be focused on. Loving our wives by doing the will of Allah Hayyam, overcoming ourselves in humility, so that we may save her, as Christ is the Savior of the church. It shows we love Allah Hayyam, ourselves, and our wives by operating like this. By precept, our love has to abound in knowledge and judgment according to the instructions of the law. Can you read Philippians 1, verse 9 and 10, please? And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent. By implementing the laws for instruction, it's what helps us understand the things that are excellent because we're investigating the deity to prove his way right and true by the results we receive from walking in his ways. Can you read Romans 2 and 18, please? And knoweth his will, and approveth the things that are more excellent being instructed out of the law. By precept, let's see what will be the result of applying the excellent instructions of the law in our lives. The rest of Philippians 1 and 10, please. That ye may be sincere and without offense to the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Yahshua Christ, unto the glory and praise of Allah Hayyam. So, when we're implementing the excellent instructions of the law in love, our knowledge will grow in the will of Allah Hayyam to do good judgment, which will result in us being sincere and without offense in the sight of Allah Hayyam, by working the fruits of righteousness, though we may offend the world in some respects. The knowledge of the laws is what was given us for life and light to walk in it with our wives and others. Can you read Baruch out of the Apocrypha, chapter 3, verse 35 to 37, please? This is our Allah Hayyam. And there shall none other be accounted of in comparison of him. He hath found out all the way of knowledge, and hath given it unto Jacob his servant, and to Israel his beloved. Afterward did he show himself upon earth, and converse with men. So we see he found out all the way of knowledge, and had given it unto Jacob. Let's see when he conversed with men what he gave for that knowledge. Sirach chapter 45, verse 1 and verse 5, please. And he brought out of him a merciful man, which found favor in the sight of all flesh, even Moses, beloved of Allah and men, whose memorial is blessed. Okay. Sirach chapter 45, verse 5. He made him to hear his voice and brought him into the dark cloud and gave him commandments before his face even the law of life and knowledge, that he might teach Jacob his covenants and Israel his judgments. So when Allah had found out all the way of knowledge and given it unto Jacob, he came and conversed with men, specifically Moses, his servant, who heard his voice, and he gave him the laws of life and knowledge so that he could teach us these things so that we could have all the knowledge 
that will help us in this life. All right. Continue in Baruch chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, please. This is the book of the commandments of Elohim, and the law that endureth forever. All they that keep it shall come to life, but such as leave it shall die. Turn thee, O Jacob, and take hold of it. Walk in the presence of the light thereof, that thou mayest be illuminated. All right. That's the knowledge Peter spake of. For us to walk in, though it may be an offense to some, nonetheless, we would be fulfilling the law to dwell with our wives according to the knowledge of the law. Can you read First Peter chapter 3, verse 7, please? Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. A wife being the weaker vessel will require the man to walk more in the fruits of righteousness, to love her according to the law, and beware of the bitterness towards her in the process, as anger, wrath, envy, hatred, or pride, or fornication can lead us to fall into that spirit of bitterness, or resentment, or grudging, or frustration. Can you read Colossians 3 and 19, please? Husbands. Love your wives and be not bitter against them. There may come some instances where the devil may tempt you to do something against the law. This goes for brothers and sisters, by the way. He may tempt you thinking it's because of something your spouse is or isn't doing. But truly, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So it's some spirit at work to tempt us to get frustrated or bitter. We may also be tempted by our own desire of how we want things to be or how we feel, but remembering the admonitions of the anger lesson, we have to keep the faith to stay out of emotions, to cleave to the law, to keep from evil no matter what others may be saying or suggesting or doing. Can you read Psalms 37 verse 8, please? Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. That's for either spouse to stand steadfast in the faith, even when evil spirits or our feelings may inspire the desire not to do so. Now men dwell with a spouse according to the knowledge of the law and ensue peace by the means instructed in the law so that no bitterness springs up to cause the man to fall out of the faith. Can you read Hebrews 12 verse 14 and 15, please. Follow peace with all men in holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of Elohim, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Amen. As we can see, a man has a responsibility to follow peace and holiness in his life and with his household to see the Lord in the end, and has to be diligent to continue growing in the knowledge and judgments of love through the excellent instruction of the law, lest he fall from the grace and opportunity to get things right by giving into the vexation of the lust of the flesh, to get bitter or frustrated about the struggles of himself or his wife, or even his children, I would add. So a man has to be attentive to how he may please the Lord, so that he may please his wife in truth by doing right for her salvation and his. For these reasons and responsibilities, a man's duties to his own family take precedence over his duty to his parents when married. Can you read Ephesians 5, verse 31 and 32, please? For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Thus, from the creation, male and female comprise a family, just as Christ and the church is a household, and the Father and the Holy Spirit is a household. And we, men and women, are made in the image of Allah Hayyam, and we come together as a household. Can you read Romans 1 and 20, please? 
For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Elohim head, so that they are without excuse. That word Elohim head is G2305. It's divinity or divine nature. So we understand the spiritual things by the things that are made. What we have in the creation is an example of the divine nature of the Elohim head. There was the father and the Holy Spirit, the first female, his wife. They created their son, the only begotten and beloved. And from the son came the next female, which is the church. When Elohim said, let us create man in our image, and he made them male and female, Christ and the church was who was made. Christ, the son, left his parents, his father and mother, to be with his wife, the church. Even so, in this world, man leaves his parents to be with his wife. And likewise, as the church, a wife cleaves to her husband, submitting to him in everything, even as the church does unto Christ. So we can understand we truly are here in this world to represent Allah Hayyam and walk in his image and his likeness. Is that good? Amen. Okay. Uh, so we see we were made in the image now let's see how the family hierarchy is viewed in the sight of Allah Hayyam, right? Can you read 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3, please? But I will have you know that the head of every man is Christ. Now, why is Christ a man's head? 11 and 7, please. For as much as he is the image and glory of Allah Hayyam. For this reason... Christ is man's Lord and master. Continue in 11 and 3, please. And the head of Christ is Allah Hayyam. Why so? Can you read Sirach 3 and 11, please? For the glory of a man is from the honor of his father. The father has honor over everything in creation, so he is the head and glory of his son Christ. Now, what about the woman? Can you continue back to 11 and 3, please? And the head of the woman is the man. And this is interesting to touch on the Hebrew a bit here. This is from the Hebrew word for head. H376, the word is ishi. In Igbo to this day, it still means head. And in the scriptures, it means man, husband. So you can see the language still correlates to the original meaning of the words. Now, why do Arahayim ordain it to be so, that a man is a woman's head? Can you read 1 Corinthians 11 and 7, please? The woman is the glory of the man. A reason he is her head is because she is his glory, just as man is the glory of Arahayim. In the family, just as Allah Hayyam in Christ, a man is Lord of the family. Looking at the Hebrew for understanding here. The word H1167. This is a Hebrew word for husband and master. It's still in the Yoruba dialect today. The word is Bale or Bale. And it can depend on how you pronounce it because Hebrew is a language of tone, pitch, and pronunciation. Depend on your pronunciation of it, you're saying husband or master. And in the Hebrew text, this word means a master, hence a husband, or figuratively, owner. Remember we started where it said he that gets a wife getting a possession? That's his possession. He's the owner of that wife from Allah Hayyam. A man being a woman's head is why he is called a woman's husband. In English, which originally meant master of a house looking at the english definition the old english word for husband it's husband in the sense male head of a household and manager steward so he manages the home and it's interesting that he's a manager right because christ is his head in the law zach well this is where the law gives understanding you know about the law about Hebrew servants, right? Mm -hmm. If that servant, after his seven years, if he wants to stay, 
PA says, I love my master and my wife. I'm not going anywhere, right? But mm -hmm. if he leave, he has to leave on his own because the wife and the children belong to her master. I mean, his master. His master. So, so even so, man is manager and steward because the children, the wife, they belong to the Lord. And if he's pleased to dwell with the Lord, the Lord will keep the house together. But if the man leaves from the Lord, he has to go on his own. The Lord has dominion over the family. So we truly, though a man is put in a position as master of his house, he's truly a servant to the Lord, his head and Lord and master. All right. And that goes right with our teachings. Um, when we were teaching, I forgot what lesson it was in, but when we were teaching about how you have to raise your children to actually serve Elohim. Like you're not raising your children to serve you. You're raising your children to serve Elohim. So it goes right hand in hand with it. And mm -hmm. even the owner part, um, you know, in many customs, um, when you get a wife, you have to pay the dowry. Even in scriptures, you pay the dowry. So it shows that the man is actually taking possession of the woman by giving the dowry and and so on and so forth of the marriage customs to then be the owner of the woman or be the head of the woman. So, Amen. That was the uh, spirits of narcissism lesson. Okay. Well, we talked about that. Definitely check that out if you haven't had the opportunity. Now, finishing up on the English word husband to help see how it still correlates to the original Hebrew understanding of a man being master of the house. From the Old Norse, husbandi, it means master of a house. From hus, which means house, and bandi, occupier or tiller of the soil. So interesting that he's the worker and he's the one that has stewardship or management over the household. That goes into husbandry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Man, remember Allah told man that he has to work, he has to go till the soil by the sweat of his brow. So it, it all ties back for sure. Now, the woman's man being her Lord, women in the faith reverence their husband by calling him Lord, as Sarah and Rebecca did respectively, amongst other endearing terms they may have for cherishing their own husband. Can you read First Peter chapter 3? Verse 5 and 6, please. But after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also, who trusted in Allah, adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. And so there you have understanding for sisters. In daring terms as Lord, if you like to use Hebrew, Adonai, or your husband. That's also a word for master. <laughs> it's right. interesting, Casa. Um, you know, like what we put out is actually what we receive. Like, so if if we look at something as if it's trash or if it's not that it's not that it's not worth as much, you're gonna treat it like that. If you treat something like a treasure, you're going to take care of it, and it's going to stay a treasure, just like a home. If you treat a home with reverence and respect, and, you, and, you, and you're appreciative for what you were given, you're going to make the, the house beautiful. But if you take it for granted, then you're going to trash the house. So even in just saying the word or having that reverence and word towards your husband, it actually starts manifesting itself into your works toward your husband by even just speaking the words of reverence toward him or having that word of reverence toward him so it's, it's kind of like a, a building block to actually kind of get you going in the right direction mm, thanks for sharing that that's that's definite that's the spirit behind that is the right spirit because it's what the commandment showed <laughs> so it'll definitely help get you out and get you where you're trying to go <laughs> Now, when this man and woman has children, the father is the lord of his children, also having that honor over them, as Abram called his father his lord in Jasher 11 and 20. 
also Rebekah and Ishmael's wife, called Abraham their father-in-law, my Lord, as well, in Jasher 26, 1, and Jasher 21 and 40, for understanding of how the children also reverence their father as their Lord as well. Of course, remember there's other endearing terms, daddy, we know of common terms in our respective languages today. But as Zachwell said, in the realm of building toward the goal in cherishing and honoring, using those terms, it'll help us. Because the scriptures speak of them for good reason. <clears throat> now, a father having honor guides his wife as his own sister. And his wife guides the children in the ways that their father teaches them. So Elohim himself is head of his woman, the Holy Spirit. And Christ is head of the church, his woman. And both households operate likewise. That's the hierarchy of a family from creation. Christ learned from his invisible father. And man learns from Christ, our everlasting father through his ministers and the law and testimonies that he gave gifts unto for edifying his children, for the perfecting of the saints. While the woman learns from the man, whether her husband or father in the faith, and if either one is not in the faith, then the minister of the Lord, because her head is in unbelief. And hopefully remember, wives, how knowest thou you may save your husband? In her work, hopefully they'll turn him around and convert him by her chaste conversation and manner of living. Now, hopefully that we got a understanding of the household, the hierarchy, and how things were set up from Alahayim, and a focus for the men to dwell with their wives according to knowledge in the law, and abiding in that without being bitter and keeping things simple and being sincere without offense to Alahayim so as to convert and save their wives and family. Now let's jump into looking at Alahayim's work in the household. Let's look at what he's doing. <sighs> we know the father gave his law and Christ gave his testimonies and the commands of his father for his children. Can we read John 12 verse 49 and 50, please? For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Amen. So we see a son walking in line, remembering the admonitions of his father and passing it on to his children. Now the mother, the Holy Spirit, she has come into the world after Christ ascended to get the household of Allah together. Can we read John chapter 16, verse 7, please? Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send her unto you. Now, notice here. An adult son, though he still honors his mother, he has authority to send his mother because he is as a brother to her when he becomes a man, unlike her authority over him when he was a youth. Now, a son's power varies if his father is still alive, of course. Can you read John 15 verse 26, please? But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the spirit of truth, which proceeded from the Father, she shall testify of me. Though the son has power to send his mother, when a father is still living, a son has to get his father's permission to have his mother do something, since a father has honor over him as his Lord all the days of his life. Can you read John 14, verse 16, please? And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that she may abide with you forever. If we see here, his father is still living. So the son has to ask the father for the mother to be sent 
as a father has honor over the family all their lives. John 14 and 26, please. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. You see here, the son had to get his father to consent and to send her as she is his wife. All right, let's see what the Spirit will do. She shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. And there we see, she instructed the apostles as a mother her sons and caused them to remember the words of Christ, their everlasting father to know and remember what he had said. Now let's see what she's coming to do for the rest of her grandsons in the world. And we say grandsons because remember, the Jerusalem, which is above the mother of us all. So just for putting it in layman's terms as we know it today. Proverbs 8 and 1, please. Who if not wisdom cry, and understanding put forth her voice? Verse 4. Unto you, O men, I call, and my voice is to the sons of men. She is calling unto the sons, as correction has to start with men. And we can understand this because it takes men overcoming our lusts, so we may see clearly, and our family may be purged and prospered through the afflictions of the growing process and saved in the end of it all. Verse 5, please. O ye simple, understand wisdom. And ye fools, be ye of an understanding heart. She calls unto the men to understand wisdom through the law, and be of an understanding heart to depart from the evil described in the laws. Can you read Job 28 and 28, please? And unto man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and depart from evil is understanding. Hopefully that helps to know what she's calling us unto. She calls unto the men first, because they are the flock of the Lord Ahaya, as the head of man is Christ. Can you read Ezekiel 34, verse 31, please? And ye are my flock, the flock of my pasture, are men. And I am your Elohim, saith Adonai Ahaya. We see the importance of men getting it together for our Elohim, our own soul, and our family's sake, okay? That was just getting an understanding of what the Holy Spirit is coming to do here in these end times and why she's doing it. Because the men, that's the flock of the Lord Yache, Adonai Ahaya, and we have to get it together first to see the change and the deliverance of the household as the husband is the savior of the wife, all right? And we've done, gone through precepts in prior teachings about how when a man gets the Holy Spirit, it actually affects his children and she'll be with his generations. All right. Now we're going to jump into understanding what is going on here in these latter times and how the household has been affected as to why the Holy Spirit is here to get things together in the household. Okay. The struggles of the household. In these latter times, it was prophesied the men would be struggling as the head of the family, as was prophesied in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, by the Holy Spirit. And the evidence of them not operating in the proper order would be seen in how their household is out of order, as their children would be oppressing them, and their women ruling over them. So let's look into it. First, let's understand what the Spirit said about the sons of men from what she saw befallen us. Can you read Proverbs 8 and 5 again, please? O ye simple, understand wisdom. And ye fools, be ye of an understanding heart. The word simple is H6612. And it means silly, that is, seducible, foolish, simple, simplicity, simple one. 
in the word for fool or fools. It's H3684, and it means fool, stupid fellow, dullard, simpleton, arrogant one. And the definition of simpleton is a foolish and gullible person. So what the Holy Spirit saw, she saw the sons would be easily seduced and arrogant, making us foolish and gullible to listen and serve evil spirits, not having a moral compass of what's right and wrong. So we would be seduced to depart from the law, whether we knew it or not, in arrogance that the spirit of fornication teaches us and the spirit of hatred loves. This struggle with spiritual fornication, arrogance, and hatred was prophesied by the Spirit, and she knew our struggles would be giving heed to seducing spirits and the teachings of devils in these latter times. Can you read 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, please? Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with an hot iron. So, the simple and foolish man that the Spirit called on to, she elaborated on what is making us go astray here. Listen to seducing spirits and the teaching of devils firstly, then speaking lies and hypocrisy because we aren't doing the good things we talk about that others should do, or we are partially examining others but not focusing in on, in some cases, on ourselves, trying to see our own struggles to overcome, like hypocrites do. And all of this is while our conscience is seared, so we would be insensitive to our conscience weighing on us when we do wrong, in that arrogance and looking down on others to help keep us from seeing we need to change, or making changes in the things we need to work on. The environment and condition the Spirit showed we would be in produces men who struggle with listening to words of righteousness and yielding ourselves to the works of evil spirits, making us unwise to the wisdom and understanding in the law to perform acceptable faithfulness by actually doing the law and walking in the fruits of it. Paul prophesied of these struggles men of these last times would have. Can you read it? Second Timothy Chapter 3, verse 1, please. Can I touch on something before you go? Please. That uh, 1 Timothy 4 and 2, where it says, having their conscience seared with an hot iron, that definition means to brand, that is, to render unsensitive. When you brand something on the skin, that area that's branded has no filling. So it means to render unsensitive. So that means that they they have no feeling of doing anything wrong. They're not convicted. So you can see how they can continue operating the way they're operating. It's because they're, they're reprobate. Fortunately. The scripture said he casteth away his bowels. There's no compassion or, or natural affection. All right. You know how it, how it goes. I mean, we all been in the world. Um, you do something over and over and over and over again till you get you desensitize or you um, what's the word? Um, when you withdraw yourself, you're detached. Like you, all the feeling is out. And you're just doing something, but you're detached from what you're doing. Like, yeah. Okay. Um, Second Timothy three and one. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Hopefully, you can already understand what he's saying. Understanding what's happening here being having our conscience said where we're without feeling without remorse we're just in our desires fulfilling them 
without consideration for others. All right. Passion and mercy. Yeah. Like all of those things uh, come from the bowels. So you can see that having the the bowel. What, what was it? What do you say? Um. Uh, he casteth away his bowels. Right. Casting away your bowels, you cast away that compassion, that mercy for others, the thought of others, and how the things that you're doing affect other people. It's interesting. That's a big. That's a big step to actually start making the right steps in the faith, getting past seeing everything for ourselves. But as Paul said, look unto the things of others. You know, having bowels of mercy and compassion. He was actually t telling of what's coming and also teaching us the things to help us come out of what would befall us. But the first thing he says in Second Timothy 3 and 2, he said, For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Goes right into it. He really understood Allahim's grace just to give that admonition. So let's see what symptoms or characteristics of men struggling with arrogance and listening to evil spirits, having conscience seared with a hot iron, will look like in these last days. Continue, please. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, Without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of Allahim, having a form of holiness, but denying the power thereof. Interesting. Allahim sought out all knowledge and gave it to Jacob and passed it on through Moses to give us the light of the law, to walk in the knowledge of it. And we see all these struggles men would be facing is comprised in the law. To help us know we got away from Alahayim, these symptoms are signs of being away from Alahayim. And not being considerate of others, right? Because the law is also about how to love our neighbor. So, you got anything there, Zachary? Um, no, what you're saying is right. Um, it is about teaching us how to love one another and how to treat one another. Um, a lot of times when it comes to the law, we don't really understand the fullness of what's against us by breaking a law um you know i'm working you know casa i'm working on a lesson that's putting these perspective together of what Allah was trying to to keep us away from or protect us from by giving us a law and giving us the laws in certain regards to what is on the other side so just because we don't understand why we have to keep a law Trust and believe there is a way more important factor on the other side that as to the reason why Allah did give us the law to keep it to protect us from something else. So definitely I'm, I'm I definitely agree with you. And looking forward to that edification. Um this far I, you may have noticed it. It had struck me that it said he sought out all knowledge and gave it to Jacob. Because you know the law, he gave laws in, uh, in what's the term, in a process of time. Like more and more laws got revealed. So like he was watching and he got all the knowledge together. Like, okay, these are all the things they're going to need for the duration to help them. I'm going to give this to them so they'll be safe. And along with what you're saying, we are supposed to know that his thoughts are above ours. So he gave us what we could comprehend and do, knowing much more than we could. 
a lot of compassion. Like, a, you know, as a father, you're a parent where you can't, sometimes you can't explain things to your kids in detail for them to comprehend it, you know? All right, you have to make it very simplistic so that they can just grasp it, <laughs> not understanding the fullness of what you're actually trying to say. You're right. <laughs> A real parent, man. Put it in simple terms for us, you know. So, praise him. Now, we got some characteristics from reading Second Timothy 3 through 5. We got some characteristics or results that can be seen in men who struggle with being seduced by evil spirits and unwise to the wisdom and understanding in the law to combat these evil spirits because they have walked in doctrines of devils as opposed to the true doctrine of Allah Hayyam, to overcome evil spirits by doing his will instructed in the commandments. Now, these men would have a form of holiness, an outward show, appearing clean on the outside, but within they wouldn't be as clean as they seem by denying the power of Allah Hayyam, that is shown in all patience and long suffering with joy as Colossians 1 and 11 speaks of. So the simplicity is, it may seem clean on the outside, but the fruits of the Spirit, particularly in patience and long-suffering with joy, will show what's inside the cup, if it's truly the power of Allah, I am there. Well, there will be a lot of manipulation. Okay. Having a form of holiness, but denying the power thereof. They're truce breakers. They're false accusers. They despise those that are good. They're traitors. They will manipulate. Gotcha. And they will lie and say what needs to be said to get what they want. I see what you're talking about. If you haven't had opportunity, brothers and sisters, reference the narcissist's lesson to understand these things. Yeah. And it's interesting, through understanding the scriptures and edification, we can see this, right? But if a person doesn't understand these things, doesn't understand the laws and the testimonies, let's see what these men struggling having an outward show would be able to do in chapter 3 verse 6 of Timothy please for of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins led away with diverse lust so these men not only struggle themselves but also capture women who are struggling with lust and spiritual attacks to sin as well. Hopefully it helps understand. Getting understanding, getting edified, it not only helps us in our own walk, but it also helps us be able to help others by identifying where people are, what they're struggling with, to know or to seek counsel in how we are to operate with them within the law to make sure we're doing things in wisdom and don't get caught up by taking other people's sins. Let's learn about what women would be struggling with in these last days as we've kind of got a, a, a gist. We got a foundation of what's going on with the men. Let's see what's happening to the women here in these times. Let's start again at verse six, please. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Okay. Here we see, in these last times, or in these latter times, it was prophesied the silly women, which are the gullible, to listen to evil spirits, they will struggle with diverse lusts, and have a lot of sins weighing on them. Though unable to confess their own faults, as it said, they will be laden with sins. So that guilty conscience would be weighing on them to keep them where they are. In some cases, unable to forgive themselves for the mistakes made or others for something they may have done to them. 
as these things weigh on us from being able to truly believe in Christ, to let go of our heavy burden and put on his yoke of meekness, lowliness, and forgiveness of heart to overcome our sins. For these unfortunate struggling women, Paul saw they would still be ever learning, as women are more studious than men. So the struggle they would have isn't because they aren't studying, but it's really because they aren't learning for the right reasons, so they never come to the knowledge of the truth of the gospel, to purge their heart from evil. Sisters, these things are to relay the truth of the prophecies concerning those who fall into these struggles, for awareness and insight to combat it if you find yourself fitting into this prophecy. We encourage you all just to watch the women's series, to self-examine, and be sure no sin or lust are keeping you away from your hope of salvation, nor is any gullibleness through lack of understanding the truth of the law and fruits of the Spirit leading you to be seduced by a man who professes holiness, but denies the power of it by his works not being done in the fruits of the Spirit or keeping of the law. Hopefully this helps for the sisters. Anything else, Zephyr, before I go? Yes. Um, let me find it real quick. When you said that women aren't learning for the right reasons, that part struck out to me because many of our sisters, even in no matter what religion it is, they they have a hard time taking accountability. And what happens is that they're learning to see the faults in others instead of learning to see the faults in themselves and to change themselves within. And I think that focus right there is what is the downfall for many of our sisters here in the end times and has been a downfall for our sisters is that they're not taking the accountability and learning the information for their own growth, but they're learning it so that they can see what other people are doing wrong. And I think that right there is what needs to be changed or redirected for the women so that they can actually get on the right track and actually start actually growing. And, and Allah can start working in them truly. Amen. Amen. Paul taught on that for us all too. Let's examine ourselves. Lest we be reprobate. Focus is building within. Anything else there? Thank you for that. No, no, I'm good. Thank you. Amen. Praise Allah. That's good. Now, touching back on the focus from the men, or on the men, we see the struggles women would be in in these end times. And men have a part to play in that as the head of the household. Unfortunately, men not having it together, different things can put their daughters in tough spots. It can be that they would not be in their daughters' lives to raise them in some cases. And then, when they are in their life, in some cases, they're combated by the spouse when they're trying to implement good works. Or, they're not teaching their daughters the right way to go according to the law, to combat the evil spirits against them through righteousness, or how to be shamefaced under obedience and seeking how to please their heads as young women or when married. It could have also been that the man didn't wait on Allah Hayim and got with an unbelieving woman who guides the children contrary to Allah Hayim's ways, as he isn't walking in the faith himself to win her over to the faith, to steer the family in the right direction. There are different ways a man can have an effect on his daughter, not going in the right way, through her upbringing or experiences. A woman needs a man for her salvation, whether her father, husband, or minister in the Lord, as it's in the scriptures for women to learn from men, not a serpent authority over them, and submit to their man's rule over them. But some women, due to their experiences growing up or encounters with men in their life or the influence of society on women to go against Allah Hayim's ways, 
These women struggle with absorbing authority over men and the unwillingness to submit themselves to men to learn from them. So a lot of women are ever learning, but they'll not be able to come to the knowledge of the truth because of their struggle with submitting to men. Then there are those women who are willing to learn, knowing it's Allah Hayim's will that they learn from men, but they can't come to the knowledge of the truth if the men aren't getting it together themselves to walk in truth to win them over and teach them the truth by their actions and words in sound doctrine. So all in all, in these latter times, women also come up in unhealthy environments and are struggling like the men and not being aware of the knowledge of the truth and the law and the fruits of it. They aren't wise in wisdom and understanding to identify struggling men that they are coming into contact with. And they get led captive into doctrines of devils by these men or relationships with these men that aren't built on the foundation of Christ and the law and testimonies and fruits, which produces a bad parenting situation. As a result of both parents not being founded in the faith, the family structure was prophesied to be out of order with women ruling over men and children oppressing their parents. Did you have anything else before jumping in? Are you good? Yes, I do. Um, okay. I definitely believe that many women can see the attack on the sons of Israel, but many of the women can't necessarily see the attack on themselves. I believe that they do see what happens to the men. They see us struggling in the workforce. They see our um, us having problems with the police. They see us having problems with ourselves, the attacks against us, the agenda against us. But many of the women, I feel, are not aware of the attacks that are coming towards them. Um, how that father being out of the household affects them. How, uh, how Section 8 with working against them. How single mother households are working against them. How the agenda of how a woman should be according to the worldly standard is working against them. How I mean, we can keep on going on and on, but I, I think that that part is lacking as far as the exposure of it where women aren't really seeing the effects of how the agenda is against them as well and how it's been working and how it's been lifting up the women. Now in the workforce, many of the women, since they are more studious, they're getting the better jobs. And now it's changing the dynamic away from Alahayim, where the man is supposed to be the head of the household to now the woman is the head of the household and she's like, okay, the man needs to be at home since I'm making the money. He needs to be at home. He needs to be cooking for me. You know, so you can see how it's shifting based off of money, based off of finances, where that's not what Alahim looks after. Alahim doesn't look after finances because Alahim give it and take it away. He can lift the man up anytime he sees fit. So it's actually the righteousness, the obedience, the fruits of the spirit, his obedience to the law and humbling and the humility of humbling himself to keep the law and to subdue himself from evil is actually what Alahim is looking after, which is, which actually is how a man would lead the household by those things. He wouldn't lead the household by money. So I see, I don't think that the attack is really um, showcased enough in a fashion where people can actually realize the effects of both sides and how the attack is on all of us. So therefore we all need to come together in Alahayim. You know, Definitely. Definitely. <laughs> we have to get into that one day. Let's look at 
the results of this attack on the family in Isaiah 3 and 12, please. As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O my people, they which lead thee cause thee to error and destroy the way of thy paths. So, since the men have been overcome with idolatry, giving heed to seducing spirits and arrogance, and that women struggle with diverse lusts, laden with sins, ruling the men to help lead them astray, as Adam was cheated by Satan through his wife, we see the family structure is out of the way of Elohim, out of the way that he ordained it in his law, where a woman acts as the head, leading the man, and the children are unwell, oppressing their parents. And as Zakwa is relying, society has help foster this whole thing with the the women's liberation this interest in liberation from what <laughs> liberation from who exactly because they they've created an environment where the women don't take accountability many women don't take accountability and they're raising the children with the same mentality that they have themselves. So therefore, the children aren't taking accountability. So you see what actually happens, then the children are unruly. So they start oppressing the parents because there's no accountability for them either. Mm -hmm. And usually the one that brings the accountability is the father. Mm -hmm. That's true. It's happening. Perilous times that we're in and going into, further into. So, now seeing the prophecy for the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem, it shows women would rule over their men instead of their men ruling them. And this shows in society amongst the Jews, women would be in prominent positions and in the household relationship, the woman will hold the most influence over the family, as society teaches for it to be done, with concepts like, she wears the pants, or happy wife, happy life, to be sure to give her what she wants, if you want to be happy. All of which is turning things upside down, where a woman is ever learning for her own interests and desires, and that knowledge is puffing her up to usurp authority over men to rule over them. And it's hurting her in the long run because not submitting herself to a man of understanding to learn from him, she will continue learning but never come to the knowledge of the truth to save her soul. It's food for thought for sisters to see the simplicity of doing what Allah am commanded to do is great wisdom and will profit you to come to the knowledge of the truth, embracing your important role as a helpmeet to a man rather than the devil's desire for you to rule over a man and lead him to air, as the prophecy shows in Isaiah here, where it said, they that rule over thee, lead thee to air. Did you need anything there, Zachary? Um, The only part you said a woman would be ever learning for her own interests and desires. And in the, uh, the Testament of Reuben, it speaks of how women would go about doing that. Which so the woman actually would learn, start learning manipulation to actually get in what she wants because she doesn't have power over a man. Right. She overcomes by craft and right. outward appearance. Learn to seduce so and everything that she learns right so everything that she learns is to give her power so she would learn the law to use it in her convenience or she would learn something else to use it in her convenience to then to bring you back into a place where she wants you 
So she will bring up the fruits of the spirit when she sees something that you're not doing right or it's something that's against her. But then when she's out of line of the fruits of the spirit, it's null and void. So you can see how it's used. And this is the same for the men that it spoke of in Second Timothy. It's the same manipulation. So they're actually partaking in the same spirit. So you can see how it's formulating and how it's affecting the household. Mm -hmm. Attacks on everybody. Right. It's more prominent for the men. It's more it's more seen. Because even look at Black Lives Matter, right? The main outlook of Black Lives Matter was the men being attacked by the police. Though there are many instances and cases where women were attacked by police too, but what did they put on the forefront? Black man. Exactly. They're not showing the other side of it so that the women can think, oh, okay, they're not touching us. We're prospering. But at the same time, they're being destroyed just in another way. And in some cases, the same way. So what it does is it causes that division. It's like, okay, well, the men are getting tore up. All right, well, we good. We don't have to worry about that. Yes, yes. The variables of prophecies being unfolded. Right. Did you have anything else there? No, no, I'm good. Okay. Now, it's not just women that are leading men to error. As it said, those that lead the men cause them to error. And let's look into that too. Because we're both men and women. We play a part in what's going on here. Through the precepts, the leaders, teachers, or parents that were supposed to guide men in the ways of Allah Hayyam have not done so. And this means the doctrines and customs the men have learned by their leaders have led us to err from the past of Allah Hayyam's family structure and his manner for the household to prosper described and understood through his law. Allah Haim has spoken of how the men have been lost, walking in the ways of unrighteousness, being led by the wrong shepherds. Let's look at it in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 1 and 2, please. Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith Ahiah. Therefore thus saith Ahiah, Allah Haim, Israel, against the pastors that feed my people, ye have scattered my flock. Remember the flock of men from that precept in Ezekiel. Continue, please. And driven them away. We've been driven away from Allah, his law, and the fruits of his Holy Spirit. And have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Haya. Being scattered from Allah, the evidence is seen in the shortcomings of the family as some or all parties involved are struggling to submit or unwilling to submit themselves to Allah Haim's ordinances for the family to flourish. Let's see how the people have been scattered. Jeremiah 23 and 13, please. And I have seen folly in the prophets of Samaria. They prophesied in Baal and caused my people Israel to err. So... And looking at how the people have been scattered, prophesying the name of other deities lead people to err. That means the true names matter as there is a spirit behind the names we call upon. And remember, the devil himself speaks some things true. So just because a person who teaches in another name may have some information that's true, it's just the doctrine of the devil using some truth to lead astray folks into lies, answering according to their desires, like Hermas was told a false prophet does.
you have to see the end goal of where they're taking you. So that's very true. Can you read that portion of Hermes Monday 11 just for reference of what we're talking about in one to four, please? He that sitteth on a chair is a false prophet who destroyeth the mind of the servants of Elohim. I mean of the doubtful minded, not of the faithful. These doubtful minded ones then come to him as to a soothsayer. And inquire of him what shall befall them. And he, the false prophet, having no power of divine spirit in himself, speaketh with them according to their inquiries and according to the lust of their wickedness, and filleth their souls as they themselves wish. For being empty himself, he giveth empty answers to empty inquirers. For whatever inquiry may be made of him, he answereth according to the emptiness of the man, but he speaketh also some true words, for the devil filleth him with his own spirit. If so be, he shall be able to break down some of the righteous. So many therefore, as are strong in the faith of the Lord, clothed with the truth, cleave not to such spirits, and hold aloof from them, but as many as are doubters, and frequently change their minds, practice soothsaying like the Gentiles, and bring upon themselves greater sin by their idolatries. And he that consulteth a false prophet on any matter is an idolater, and emptied of the truth and senseless. This ties right back in with the prophecy in Timothy about what the men would be struggling with, with that form of holiness. But the those that are... power thereof. Yeah. Because those that are strong in their faith and clothe the truth, the people actually get understanding, they wouldn't be manipulated or deceived by that form of holiness. Because they'll stand aloof from the person. They'll see the works. They'll see the manner of life the man is living, what he's actually doing. And it's big not to be in the lust of the flesh. It's big to come out of that. As, as many as are doubters and frequently change their minds, unbelief is the first of the evil spirits of the evil women, and doubtful mind is a daughter of the devil. So we really have to put the work in to overcome these things and be strong to be able to have Allah with us to show us when it's in a false prophet that's seeking to lead us astray. You know, I'm going to spill the bag real quick, okay? <laughs> <laughs> it says, having a form of holiness but denying the power thereof. We would know that today is spirituality, which is witchcraft. That's why it says, even right here, it says, as but as many as are doubters and frequently change their minds, Practice soothsaying like the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. They're actually mm -hmm. falling into witchcraft. Mm -hmm. And as you see, witchcraft is very prevalent now with men and women. And the spirit that comes with it are the spirits that we are discussing. Gotcha. Gotcha. Praise Allah for giving the insight on what's going on. And brothers and sisters, please visit the lesson called How to Identify Who is Walking in the Spirit for further edification on this specifically in regards to identifying a false prophet versus a true prophet. And also for this topic, catch that lesson called Catching the Lie. These are important lessons for understanding this, and this is essential for us because we need to understand who a false prophet is so that we would not be scattered, all right, from Allah Hayyam. And interestingly enough, we're going to get in a bit to discussing who the prophets of Allah Hayyam are prophesied to be to ensure we have that insight so that we're not led astray. Um, we're going to try to put the tags for those lessons up so you can see them up top. 
mm-hmm. how to identify who's walking in spirit and catching a lie. Hopefully, they'll be up here somewhere. Allah okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Let's delve into this more through the precepts to understand uh, false prophet for our edification to ensure we don't get scattered. Um, praise Allah Hayyam for giving Brother Johnny this precept to help us here. Zakwa, if you would read Psalms of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 1 to 15, please. Okay. Wherefore sittest thou, O profane man, in the counsel of the pious, seeing that thy heart is far removed from Ahia, provoking with transgressions the Allah of Israel? There we see the form of holiness, but denying the power thereof. All right. Continue, please. Extravagant in speech, extravagant in outward seeming beyond all men, is he that is severe of speech and condemning sinners in judgment. We see looking down on others, censoring the life of other men harshly for the sense of moral superiority. All right. A.K.A. Pride. Yes. And high-mindedness. Just like yeah. it spoke of. Yes. And his hand is first upon him as though he acted in zeal. And yet he is himself guilty in respect of manifold sins and a wantonness. That's the same thing Paul spake of where thou that sayest another should not commit adultery. Does thou commit adultery? When outward show, quick to say something or quick to condemn someone else's acts, but is guilty of the very same things, or even more in some cases. Okay. So there's no uh, accountability for themselves. Right. So it's the same heart seeking to gain the knowledge, ever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth because of the intent of heart. So. His eyes are upon every woman without distinction. His tongue lieth when he maketh contract with an oath. So fornication and lust is at work. As you know, fornication does more than just coveting after the others. All the works before were from fornication. You see it manifesting in the struggle with lustful eyes. And also not being able to be honest in what we say, All right? That's the deceit of manipulation. Right, lightly for swearing yourself. Mm-hmm. By night and in secret he sinneth as though unseen. With his eyes he talketh to every woman of evil compacts. Look at that. We talked about how he's living two different lives. When no one is around, he's a different person. He's sinning when he believes others can't see him because his concept of Allah Hayyam isn't that Allah Hayyam sees all that he's doing. Right? And he struggles with that spirit of, um, in the Reuben, it talks about the spirit of error and fantasy. He speaks with his eyes to every woman of evil compacts. His look, he's trying to entice them, trying to pollute them. And getting their attention or gaining some um, supply, some validation from them. All right. He is swift to enter every house with cheerfulness as though guileless. These are such creeping into houses, leading women astray with cheerfulness as though guileless. You get understanding of what Paul was talking about. They're coming in like it's all good, but it's a setup. Right. Love bombing. Mm-hmm. It's all love. I'm this great person. And you get to see who they are behind closed doors in secret. <laughs> mm-hmm. Let Allah remove those that live in hypocrisy in the company of the pious. Even the life of such an one with corruption of its flesh and penury. This is important to see. The big thing catch the hypocrisy. He was explaining all these things, and you can catch it if you just look and see the hypocrisy. 
You have to want to see it. True. Because the spirit of, of deceit will cause us to lie to ourselves based off our own desires. So you may clearly see the hypocrisy, but not want to see it because of your own desire, which blinds you. So you have to get yourself together and get yourself walking uprightly where you are in agreement with the law. You are in agreement with the fruits of the spirit. And it's not grievous unto you where your desire can creep in and cause you to err or be led astray. So you see how important it is to actually walk in the law with cheerfulness and joy and not be grieved of having to do something because it just shows that your desire is somewhere else where you can actually be led away. True, true. Thanks for going into that. Continue whenever you're ready. That the pious, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, let Alahayim reveal, let Alahayim reveal the deeds of the men pleasers, the deeds of such a one with laughter and derision. So he was explaining the same man that Paul was speaking of, men pleasers. Sacco, you were saying something about the different types of people that are both men pleasers. Right, the soothsayer and also the false prophet. They're both men pleasers. So you can see the, the correlation of the spirit that's behind both of them. And with what you were just speaking about, that love for the law, we have to cleave to it because it says, let Allah reveal the deeds of the men pleasers. If we're not walking in his ways and cleaving unto him, going to him for guidance and actually doing what he says, we'll get left in the darkness and we won't understand because he has to actually reveal it. He has to open our eyes to see. That the pious may count righteous the judgment of their alayim when sinners are removed from before the righteous. Can you please? Even the men pleaser who uttereth law guilefully. This touches back to just because they may be speaking the law or say some things that are true, it doesn't mean. It's from Alahayim because they're doing it with guile or covetousness. Okay. Continue, please. Or expound, if you will. I want to touch on verse 9 real quick. It says that the pious may count righteous the judgment of their Alahayim when sinners are removed from before the righteous. When you see things happening to a person, you have to understand that it's happening for a reason. You may not understand why a person may have such hardship or they may have something that's going on constantly or that they fall into to, to bad situations over and over again. But it's Alahayim that's actually doing it. When sinners are removed from before the righteous, so even in your own life, there may be somebody that may be going through a lot or or bad things are always happening to them. And a lot of times it's because of their deeds. Like even maybe the way that they may be treating you or the things that they may do to you that you are unaware of because People, they may be lying to you. They may be manipulating you. And you may not be aware of it. That's the whole point of manipulation. And the whole point of lying is to, to get over on you or to, or to beguile you. But Allah sees it all, no matter if you see it or not. So that's why I said, when sinners are removed from before the righteous. So you may be operating in sincerity of heart 
where they may not. And Allah may remove them from your presence or may cause their life to be tumultuous. But it's because Allah is reproving them. It's not for you to go and and seek vengeance of your own because vengeance is of Allah. So you continue walking in the simplicity and godlessness of Allah and let Allah show forth what you are to do or allow him to do what he's going to do. Right? Because he will show it. That's why I said, let Allah reveal the deeds of the men pleasers in verse 8. Because he will reveal it to you. You just have to be patient. And sometimes you have to endure until he does show it to you. And not lose your patience and long suffering. And Jacob waited till Allah showed him it was time to go from Laban. Yes, he did. It's good understanding. Thank you. Amen. I'm in uh, verse 11. And their eyes are fixed upon any man's house that is still secure, that they may, like the serpent, destroy the wisdom with words of transgressors. This is um, helping understand some of the spirits that the person struggles with envy and jealousy and despises of them that are good, like Paul spake of. So when people are doing well, your house is secure. They're going to seek to take you down with words of transgression. Seek to infiltrate your house with whether they're teachings or whatever they may do. Allah knows. Make sure y'all go and check out the the spirits of narcissism. Um, that lesson actually goes into this, where they feel like a narcissist doesn't go after a person that is easily defeated. They go after somebody they feel is strong. They go after someone who they feel is put together well, because they get a sense of exhilaration from being able to conquer somebody. So you can see the spirit at work here that they actually want to conquer houses that are secure. They're coming to your house. They see how well you're doing. They see how good you're doing. And they're like, okay, I'm going to take you down and I'm going to rule over you and control you. And then they cause you to fall into transgression so that the, the spirit that is operating in them can have dominion over you because you have to transgress for that spirit to then have rulership over you. Thanks for touching on that. And remember, don't take it personally. It's the spirits at work. We have a focus. We have to focus on Allah and doing what Allah had sent forth for us to do, just as he sent in the in the, the the acts of Thomas, how he sent him off to go and retrieve the pearl from the serpent. We have to be mindful that our focus is to keep the commandments and bear the fruit to the spirit no matter what. No circumstance, no experience, no no um no environment should cause us to go away from that. And if it does, then we have more work to do within ourselves we should be the same person we should be standing on the rock of our salvation no matter the circumstances no matter the environment mm -hmm. and by and by that that would cause us not to be taken by the flood that would cause us not to be taken by men pleasers or false prophets or manipulators because we're actually standing on something that's secure Amen. Continue when you're ready, please. His words are deceitful that he may accomplish his wicked desire. His intent. His intent was to destroy, to fulfill his own desire because he was a lover of himself. 
So. So it's manipulation. Yes, sir. The same as what we spoke of before. Yes, sir. He never ceases from scattering families as though they were orphans. Yea, he layeth waste a house on account of his lawless desire. So for his own entrance, he's tearing families up. Okay. That's narcissism. Yes, because sir. your interest is greater than everyone else's. You're not you're you're not thinking about other people. You're only thinking about yourself. That's why I said he should, he would be a lover of himself. That's the way. There's not knows. love for others. There's only love for themselves. There's only one true love, and the only time that other people receive love is when it's in their favor, where it it makes them look good, or when they get when they're getting something out of it. It's not just for sincerity and simplicity's sake. So. That's where it ties right in. Yes, sir. He deceiveth with words, saying, There is none that seeth or judgeth. This is interesting because this is the same thing that Elohim showed Jeremiah that would be used to scatter the people as well. The concept that there's none. Nobody understands. Nobody knows the actual truth. So we all can freely do as we please. And also nobody can hold me accountable because there's nobody that sees what I'm doing. This is deception and manipulation. I'm getting over on you. Nobody can tell. And there's no one to judge. Nobody's going to hold me accountable for what I'm doing. So they can continue. This is that searing of the conscience. This is one of the perspectives of the conscience being seared. To why there's no need to change. There's no accountability. We all can do right in our own sight. Yeah. So because we all can do right in our own sight, nobody can correct no one. There's no common grounds or common basis of expectation and standard. So everybody can create their own standard and walk in it. And that right there, that's spirituality. Is See that truth? Right. The Alaheim is within you. So now you can dictate what's right and wrong. That's the same thing that the devil told Eve at the very beginning. Yeah. That she would be as Alahayam, knowing good and evil for herself. It's spirit it's witchcraft. Disobedience is as witchcraft and idolatry, according yes, to is. precept. Right. That's in my lesson. It's in there. <laughs> I'm you trying I don't I don't know what's all in it. I'm trying not to say no, too much. It's okay. It's fine. It, the lesson is going to be the lesson, but it's coming. So it's yeah. it's just it's just where we are. It's true. Yeah. The time that Allah Hayim knows that. Go ahead. I, no, no, you're good. Go ahead. I'm going to say Allah Hayim knows the timing of this stuff because this man is a narcissist. Right. Being plain. The next verse is going to point it out. I've been in Narcissus and Tasa how they... A narcissist uses you, gets their their supply from you, and when they're done with you, they discard you, and they're on to the next when they find another source of supply. And that's what he's about to do in the next verse. Right. That's crazy. He fills one house with lawlessness, and then his eyes are fixed upon the next house to destroy it with words that give wing to desire. Yet with all these, his soul is like Shoel, it is not sated. So there Covet goes the hot iron. And the covetousness. Right. So we get to see the spirit of a narcissist and their intent. Their intent is to fill the house with lawlessness. They come in, just let me be. Don't correct me. Let me do what I'm going to do. 
and we will be okay. So then they bring it. You say, okay, I'm going to let you be. But by doing so and not holding them to a standard or having any boundaries allows them to operate lawlessly. And they bring in all the lawlessness into the home until the home is completely consumed with lawlessness. And once they see that you're in a bad case, they leave because they've completed their task. Because who are they working for? The serpent. Right. And even in the Acts of Thomas, that demon actually was speaking of how it would operate to get um, a vessel of habitation to do the will or the work of the master that sent him. So you can see even here how this spirit is the same spirit operating in a person that's actually causing that house to be consumed with other spirits, other evil spirits. And then once it sees that that house is consumed with evil spirits, it discards you. It leaves you in that bad state and goes on to find another house to then destroy and leave into a bad state and continue moving on in that cycle. It sounded like you explained how the relationship goes with that false prophet. It's the same spirit. Mm -hmm. So you can see even the false prophet, when you come and they speak to you as like a soothsayer and everything just crumbles before you, none of the stuff happens, whatever the case is, or maybe one thing happens, but everything else doesn't. You come back to them and they discard you too, because now you're a problem. You're a threat to my image. You can expose that something didn't go right that I prophesied. So now I have to get away from you and I have to completely disregard everything that you're saying to devalue you and to discredit you. Same spirit. If you would touch on here in regards to the false prophet as a teacher, teaching the doctrine of devils as Paul spake of, right? He said, he filleth one house with lawlessness. Now, I think this verse in 15 explains how he does that by with words that give wing to desire. So he's teaching a doctrine that opens the door to give way, to let your lust go free, to be liberated, to fulfill mm -hmm. desires. That's how he gets the house in regards to that teacher it's going to end up leading the house to give in to the loss and not change. It's and, liberation. Yeah. That's why when you said earlier, you said, what are they liberated from? Mm -hmm. Like you're liberated from Allah. That's the only liberation that you can have because there's only two sides. So when they come and they, they're filling that house with liberation, look, just let me be me. Let me do me. And don't say nothing. Let me do what I'm going to do and we'll be good. That person came in, set the standard of liberation and lawlessness. And if you go along with it, you're going to fall into the same desire of liberation because that is the standard of the house now. Yeah. And unfortunately, when he gets you where he wants you, after giving you those teachings, he's done she. with you. He or she, right? Because they have the spirit of Jezebel is also at work in the um, prophetesses in these end times. When they get you where they need you, they know you're given over. Then they're on to the next family to try to go fulfill their supply of being ruling, being lord over someone, and also causing them to fall. They love the challenge. Yes. And it helps them also not have to change because if they can continue getting other people to go sin, it justifies that nobody can be perfect and nobody can get it right. So nobody can tell me anything either. There's no one that judges. Right? This is tough. This is tough.
And you see the spirit at work in it all, covetousness, not sated. This is good. Is there anything else on this, Echo? For the moment. No, we're good. We keep rolling. All right. Again, please visit the lesson, How to Identify Who's Walking the Spirit and Catching a Lie, to ensure you get good understanding of these things in regards to teachers and prophets, to ensure you're following the right names and folks for soul's sake, as we are not to let the reverence for any man cause us to fall. Okay. So continuing in understanding how men have been scattered from Alahayim, we got understanding of false prophets and we got understanding that prophesying in false names also comes with doctrines of devils that are being called upon well, let's see what else scatters the people from Alahayim. jeremiah 23 or 14 please i have seen also in the prophets of jerusalem a horrible thing they commit adultery and walk in lies Interesting what we just came out of reading about, right? <laughs> Prophets are hypocrites, walking in lies, not upholding the truth of the law and the fruits of the spirit, while indulging in fornication against Alahayim, listening to idols, which shows in their works that can include literally committing adultery in the flesh or with the eyes, as we read about that prophet who has that conversation with every woman with his eyes. Now, and also, we you know, walking in lies from the doctrines they're teaching, teaching things that are help give wing to desire and create lawlessness. Now, what are other symptoms of adultery against Alahayim and lies? Continue, please. They strengthen also the hands of evildoers, that none doeth return from his wickedness. There's that doctrine that he teaches. Giving wing to desire, strengthening the hands of evil those, so making us feel stronger and more empowered in the wrongs that we're doing. So that none of us would actually return from our wickedness. We would not come to repentance and actually put the work into change. So, not only are they walking in lies themselves and sinning, but they are also enabling or helping evildoers with their teachings so that no one has to return from his wickedness to repent and actually change their ways. Continue, please. They are all of them unto me as Sodom, and the inhabitants thereof as Gomorrah. Sodom was known for its pride and ill dealings, and the judges of the land would justify the wrongdoings, so no one had to change. So these prophets do the same thing with their teachings and how they lead people to operate. Ahaya doesn't want us to listen to these types of teachers. Can you read verse 16, please? Thus saith Ahaya of hosts, hearken not unto the words of the prophet that prophesy unto you. They make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of Ahaya. They make people vain with the visions they prophesy of their own heart's desire, just as we read in the Psalms of Solomon. And it's evident as it's not making anyone have to repent and turn from his evil doing and change his ways. Let's see how they strengthen evildoers so we can understand by precept what that actually looks like. Can you read verse 17, please? They say still unto them that despise me, Ahiah hath said, Ye shall have peace. To despise Ahiah is shown by not keeping his commandments, but the pastors tell them they will have peace nonetheless, according to their teaching, and it strengthens them to think they are highly favored and blessed, so they don't have to actually change. And mind you here, we saw that prophesying in the name of other deities is a symptom of a false prophet and that will lead us astray. But also, 
even if one is saying it in the name of Ahaya, if one is teaching us in a manner that leads us to think we will have peace even though we're not doing right, that's not who Ahaya sent. Okay? Continue when you're ready, I'll add if you will. And they say, unto everyone that walketh after the imagination of his own heart, no evil shall come upon you. Everyone that walks in his own perspective of right or wrong, not submitting himself to the law and to the fruits of the Spirit, is being told by these prophets that no evil shall come upon them. This unfortunate condition of being enabled and supported in our sins and wrong perspectives has scattered the flock because no one has to change and do right by submitting their thoughts, themselves, and how they operate to the law and the fruits of the Spirit. Now, what are these prophets using to justify their teachings? Can you read verse 18, please? For who hath stood in the council of Ahia, and hath perceived and heard his word? Who hath marked his word and heard it? Remember the same man said, None seeth or judgeth? These prophets and, and pastors, they don't allow people to consider the counsel of Ahia in his law and testimonies, and tell them no one hears his words like the true prophets who would hear by dreams and visions. So this means no one knows the truth. So we all can speak according to our perspective and decree and declare what we want so that the false prophet can continue giving you visions of his own heart that will be what you want to hear and you can continue in the imaginations of your heart to do what you want to do. And neither has to seek the counsel of Allah Hayyam to know the truth of a matter, since no one can actually know it anyway. And that means every person has their own truth. And we all are supposed to enable one another to continue in what's right in our own eyes. If you have anything to add, Zahba? No, that's, a, that's society. That's where we are right now. That's it. As prophesied. All right. Continue verse 21 and 22, please. Mm -hmm. I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. These types of pastors and teachers... Elohim had not sent, and yet for vainglory they ran and do prophesy. Continue, please. But if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. So here this is a good point to come to, because here we see the dichotomy of good prophets and teachers. Because good shepherds stand in the council of Ahaya, found in his law, in testimony, to walk and to speak according to the light of it, and the knowledge in it. And when they speak, they cause people to hear the word of Ahaya in his law and testimonies, that leads them to turn from their evil ways and doings, so that they may take advantage of the liberty of the grace period. That's important because those that despise Ahaya and walk in their own imaginations would not have peace, nor would they not see evil as the false prophets are telling them. If they do not utilize this liberty that we have in this life of free choice to get ourselves in agreement with the right desire to do right by what Allah commands us. Okay. Can you read Sirach 15 and 14, please? He himself made man from the beginning and left him in the hand of his counsel. Man is left to choose his own counsel. That's free choice to choose to be faithful and to keep the commandments. Continue, please. If thou wilt to keep the commandments and to perform acceptable faithfulness. So there we see we are left 
to choose if we want to, to keep the commandments and show acceptable faithfulness by performing them. That's a choice to make if we choose to. And we will be helped to do what we want, whether good or evil. Can you read Gad the seer, chapter 8, verse 7, please? And he gave each one free choice. If one wants to do good, he will be helped. And if one wants to do <laughs> evil, a path will be open for him. So we all truly do what we desire. Either Allah helps us because we truly want to do good, or the devil opens up a door for us to fulfill a desire for the pleasure we get from evil. It's a straight choice in every opportunity. Continue in Sirach 15, verse 16 and 17, please. He hath set fire and water before thee. Stretch forth thy hand unto whether thou wilt. What we want is what we reach for, a.k.a. lust after. Continue, please. Before man is life and death, and whether him liketh shall be given him. Everyone gets what we want in this life, whether we understand it or not, because by not doing the law, we show we hate it. And that reward in the end of that hatred regardless of how we try to spin it, is our life being taken. We can't deceive or manipulate Allah Hayyam. Our works are our works. With him and our words are lightly esteemed. Because remember he said, by, um, talk no more exceedingly proud. For Allah Hayyam is, Allah Hayyam, he's an Allah Hayyam of judgment. And by him, actions are weighed. That's a verse right here. You want to read it? Please. Uh, Luke 16 and 15. And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men. But Allah Hayyam knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of Allah Hayyam. So he see he really holds us accountable to what we do in our works. And that precept in Samuel was first Samuel two and three taught no more exceedingly proud. So it's not about what we say. And let not arrogancy come out of your mouth. For Ahaya is Allah of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. So he's watching what we're doing. And he's looking at what we got going on within not how we portray ourselves to men or what men think of us, but what he actually thinks of us is what matters. And don't use that to justify yourself. And for sure. You want to elaborate on that? Because so if you uh, understand. Well, what you said was, it's not what men think of us, but what Allah thinks of us. So don't use that as a way to deceive by saying Allah knows my heart, but your actions are are not good. So it actually shows your heart, you know, so you can be actually deceived yourself to think that you had a good intent, but the work was evil. But you had a good intent for your own selfishness. That's why the work came out evil. So you have to actually understand what is actually going on within yourself, not to be deceived. For sure. For sure. Thank you. Praise Allah. Gotta get to where our heart really desires his law. So that we'll always be in good standing with him and we'll always do something that would be according to his will. Amen. So let us walk without excuse to do what Allah is instructing us to do in humility of heart and obedience. Now, Understanding 
the reality of we are truly getting rewarded for what we choose to do in this life. So we don't give ourselves any excuses or let anyone else teach us some foreign doctrine or seduce us with words to think that we will be okay if we continue in our desires and our transgressions. Can you read Second Ezra chapter 7, verse 20 to 24, please? But there be many that perish in this life because they despise the law of Elohim that is set before them. But Elohim hath given straight commandment to such as came, what they should do to live, even as they came, and what they should observe to avoid punishment. Nevertheless, they were not obedient unto him, but spake against him, and imagined vain things, and deceived themselves by their wicked deeds, and said of the Most High that he is not, and knew not his ways. But his law have they despised, and denied his covenants, and his statutes have they not been faithful, and have not performed his works. With this, that's straightforward about what will be. Now let's see what Ezra's taught about what befall us with this liberty we have in this life, this opportunity, and what we do with it. Uh, Second Ezra chapter 8, verse 56, please. For when they had taken liberty... That's the liberty we have in this life of free choice while Allah is long-suffering, giving us a chance to correct ourselves to submit to his law before it's too late. Okay? For when they had taken liberty, they despised the Most High, thought scorn of his law, and forsook his ways. When we take his grace period of life being long-suffering with us, giving us the liberty to choose and do as we want, and we decide not to keep his law, or his ways and the fruits of the Spirit, what happens in the end? Second Ezra 9, verse 9 to 12, please. Then shall they be in pitiful case, which now have abused my ways, and they that have cast them away despitefully shall dwell in torments. For such as in their life have received benefits and have not known me, and they that have loathed my law, while they had yet liberty, and when as yet place of repentance was open unto them, understood not, but despised it. The same must know it after death by pain. That's the truth of the results of despising Ahaya and walking according to our own perspective of right and wrong. Instead of submitting to his law and his ways, while we have opportunity to repent so that we cannot be deceived to think otherwise by anyone bringing some unsound doctrine to teach contrary to that. All right. So here we've touched on a lot of things. We hopefully have gotten to see the struggle that would be going on in the household with the men, where it starts with the men and then the effect it has on the women and then by also how the women then also play their part in the struggle and help continue the struggle. And both parties are just in need of Allah Hayyam. And then we see also that their teachers, whether prophetess or prophets, pastors and such, that are also not helping the situation by scattering the flock of Allah Hayyam, leading them away from his law to give in to desires. Yet, the truth is that if we don't keep the law, we won't make it out of what's to come, and we will suffer for it. Nonetheless, there is deliverance to come. Elohim sees what we have going on, and he's going to bring us out if we trust in him and do the things that he commands us to do. And we're going to get into that. All right, so we see the end of not taking the grace period. An opportunity we have in this life to choose Allah and his law and his ways will be 
torments for us all, men and women. Now, though it was prophesied the men and women would be struggling in righteousness in these latter times, essentially because of disobedience to the faith of Christ, the laws, and the fruits of the Spirit, deliverance also is prophesied. So Allah will help turn things around, starting with the men, which will trickle down to the whole family, because the lost sheep shall be given shepherds to help them return to the right paths in these latter times. So it's not all doom and gloom. All I was going to deliver. Okay. Um, <laughs> Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 6 and 11 and 12, please. Ezekiel 34 and 6. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and upon every high hill. Yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth, and none did search or seek after them. So he sees the disarray of men struggling in all the earth. Continue in verse 11 and 12, please. But thus saith the Lord Ahiah, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. And this is the Lord Yache speaking. He is the Lord Ahaya or Adonai Ahaya. He himself will seek his sheep and start awakening the men of his flock unto righteousness by helping them learn to stop sinning by the preaching of the two teachers he will send. Can you read Isaiah chapter 30 verse 20, please? And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner any more, but thine eyes shall see thy teachers. Elohim knows all things. The gospel will be televised where teachers will actually be seen. All right. Continue, please. And thine ears shall hear a word behind thee saying, This is the way. Walk ye in it when you turn to the right hand and when you turn to the left. Now, isn't it interesting? Remember, we saw that the Holy Spirit has come to get the house of Allah together. She will be correcting us. Do you have Allah teachers that he's going to send? Those two witnesses, they'll be preaching. They'll be televised. And she'll be correcting us when we falter as we are learning to be obedient to the voice of Allah and his law. Let's see her process. And of course, remember, reference that lesson, honoring and understanding our heavenly parents for in-depth discussion about how the Holy Spirit gets our children where she needs them to be and how we can attain to getting the Holy Spirit. Can you read Sirach chapter 4, verse 13 to 18, please? He that holdeth her fast shall inherit glory. And wheresoever she entereth, the Lord will bless. They that serve her shall minister to the Holy One, and them that love her the Lord doeth love. Whoso giveth ear unto her shall judge the nations, and he that at attendeth unto her shall dwell securely. If a man commit himself unto her, he shall inherit her, and his generation shall hold her in possession. For at the first she will walk with him by crooked ways and bring fear and dread upon him and torment him with her discipline until she may trust his soul and try him by her laws. Then she will return the straight way unto him and comfort him and show him her secrets. And if we submit ourselves to her will, what will be built in us? Can you read Wisdom of Solomon 7 and 27, please? And being but one, she can do all things. And remaining in herself, she maketh all things anew. And in all ages, entering into holy souls, she maketh them friends of Allah and prophets. So, that's the work she's going to do. Well, from the preaching, when she's correcting everyone, getting everyone where they need to be, 
and trying everyone by her discipline and then trying us by her laws. She's going to show us a straight way, lead us to understand right and wrong straightly. She's going to make us friends of Allah Hayams and prophets in truth. And she's also going to be with our children. So you can see how what she's doing is going to help us and our family. Now, eventually the sheep of Israel will awake to righteousness and be gathered from around the world to their land too. Can you read Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 13 to 16, please? Now we'll bring them out from the people and gather them from the countries and we'll bring them to their own land and feed them upon the mountains of Israel by the rivers and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in a good pasture and upon the high mountains of Israel shall be their fold. There shall they lie in a good fold and in a fat pasture shall they feed upon the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock, and I will cause them to lie down, saith the Lord Ahia. And I will seek that which was lost, and bring again that which was driven away, and will bind up that which was broken, and will strengthen that which was sick. But I will destroy the fat and the strong, and I will feed them with judgment. He will help the poor in spirit that wants ability and has need of help, but the proud who are hastily learning information with the wrong intention may be using it for manipulation and deceit to fulfill their desires or get an advantage over others or when it's convenient for them or a proud person that may not be implementing the laws because they think they are strong in the faith already or on a level where the law doesn't pertain to them and it's causing them to wax fat, they'll be taken away when the grace period ends and when that time comes that we shall be judged for our works. So our opinions of one another means nothing in that day since we are all accountable for ourselves in the judgment. And hopefully it helps understand why it's important to focus on actually doing what's right to Allah Hayim and submitting to his law and everything because in the times to come for the house of Israel because there's a cutoff limit time for us we have to actually be in the faith obedient to his law walking in the fruits of his spirit to make it through what's to come all right regardless of what other people are doing okay Ezekiel 34 22 and 23 please therefore will I save my flock and they shall no more be a prey. And I will judge between cattle and cattle. And I will set up one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them, even my servant David. He shall feed them, and he shall be their shepherd. Now, let's understand what this is talking about. I will set up one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them, even my servant David. He shall feed them, and he shall be their shepherd. You remember the prophecy in Genesis 49 that said a scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet? Yes, it's talking about Yahweh being high priest for us. But this is also a dual parable. Allah will set up a son of his servant David here in these end times to feed the people and be their shepherd. It's a man to come teaching, but it's Christ's spirit in the man, guiding and leading. It's just as his servant David was a man after his own heart and a lawgiver of the tribe of Judah by the spirit of the Lord. The Lord Yahshua will place the son of David to fulfill his will, and he will feed men and be their shepherd. As we go through the precepts, it will bring more clarity of the dualness of this parable. Continue verse 24, please. And I, Ahiah, would be their Elohim. And my servant David, a prince among them, I, Ahiah, have spoken it. And Yahshua Christ would be these men Elohim, as he is their head. And David's son, through Christ, and by Christ in him, 
will be their prince, just as Zerubbabel, son of David, led the people by Christ's spirit out of Babylon. These things shall come to pass, as Ahiah has spoken, that not only will this son of David be a shepherd to the flock of Israel, but the Gentiles will seek after Elohim too through his ensign, that all the people of Elohim may come into the one fold in the faith of Christ. Remember Isaiah knew of the two witnesses to come. And he told of how this son of David, the same that Ezekiel is spoken of here, would be set up to gather the people of Elohim of all nations in these latter times. Can you read Isaiah chapter 11 verse 10 please? And in that day shall there be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. The root of Jesse in this verse is speaking of that same servant David that Ezekiel spake of. Remember, from the Two Witnesses series, if you hadn't seen it, please take the opportunity to check it out. You can probably easily find it in the End Times playlist. Remember from that Two Witnesses series that it was said that by Judah and Levi, shall Israel stand. And Baruch foretold that a wise man and a son of the law will be with the people to help them. In the testimonies, you have Zerubbabel, the governor of the people. He had a son of Levi, Jeshua, the priest with him, and Elohim stirring up the spirits of his people to do his will. If you're familiar with the account of what transpired in the time, leaving Babylon and Persia to return to build the house of Elohim. In these latter times, we see a son of David will be leading the people, like Zerubbabel, also as prophesied in the Testament of Dan. It will be Judah and Levi to cause Israel to stand. So these two prophets are pastors that will be given from Elohim that come according to his heart to feed with the milk of the word to help us grow. Can you read Jeremiah 3 and 15, please? I said, if you don't mind, can you tie the link between Jesse and David, please? Sure. For people that, that are not familiar. Sure. Where it says a root of Jesse, Jesse is David's father. That's why it it's speaking of the same person or the same lineage that that person has come from. Jesse is from the tribe of Judah. It comes all the way down. David was the seventh son of Jesse, and then from then there forward, this reference of the root of Jesse in that particular verse is speaking of that son of David to come here, one of the two witnesses. Also in another verse where it begins in chapter 11, it talks of a root of Jesse too. That's speaking of Christ, right? So you can know it's speaking of David's posterity. There are a few instances in scripture where Elohim will speak to the man or of the man but he's speaking of the posterity of the man. Even as in the Testament of Dan, we said that by Judah and Levi shall Israel stand. He's speaking their names, but he's speaking of their children. Um, does that help? Yes, yes. Okay, great. All right. Jeremiah 3 and 15, when you're ready. And I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Now, we know this has been a lengthy sit down here, but he said they'll feed you with knowledge. We know from the precepts, the knowledge, all that Elohim's knowledge that he gathered for us was given in the law. And the understanding of it is understood through the fruits of the spirit and the precepts. So the law and testimonies is the light which we shall be fed with in knowledge and understanding. And those pastors, according to Ahiah's heart, will be merciful, as David, who had an heart according to the Lord's, just like Moses and Aaron, as well, who were merciful men. These pastors to come were prophesied of old to come help the children of the true church. Can you read Second Ezra chapter two, verse seventeen to nineteen, please? Fear not, thou mother of the children, for I have chosen thee saith the Lord. For thy help will I send my servants, 
Esaias, and Jeremy, after whose counsel I have sanctified and prepared for thee twelve trees laden with diverse fruits, and as many fountains flowing with milk and honey, and seven mighty mountains, whereupon there grow roses and lilies, whereby I will fill thy children with joy. So, heaven and Lord Yache our Allahayim, and his pastors that he will send, being merciful and feeding us with knowledge and understanding, the flock will become fruitful and increase in good works. Jeremiah 23 and 3, please. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries, whether I have driven them, and will bring them again to their foes, and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them, but shall feed them. These shepherds is speaking of the two witnesses that Isaiah spake of, and that Christ will give power in Revelations chapter 11. Continue, please. And they shall fear no more nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith Ahia. Amen. Uh, these men will overcome the devil, not having fear or anxiety, because through the gospel and obedience to the faith, they will implement the laws and eventually walk in the love instructed in the commandments with their whole hearts, and it won't be grievous to them to do it, so they won't have to fear because they know they're doing right to Allah Hayyam, the keeper of their souls. Can you read first John 4 and 18, please? There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. Perfect love casts out the spirit of fear, because one would be obedient to Allah Hayyam in everything, as his friend. But the spirit of fear has place when we know we are doing right and our conscience weighs on us because our ways are deserving of torment. Continue, please. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. That means if we are afraid to die or be judged by Allah, it's a sign that we have not attained to being perfect in the spirit of love. To have perfect love and cast out all fear, what do we need to do? First John 5 and 3, please. But this is the love of Allah, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. We implement and keep the commandments until we overcome the evil desire, so that we are in agreement with the commandments, and they aren't grievous anymore to keep them. Then we'll know we're perfect in love, and when it's perfected, we can be bold in the day of judgment and not fair. First John 4 and 17. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. This is from the apostle, the beloved John. This doctrine of being as Christ in the world will turn the men unto righteousness, as Christ is righteous, because there will no longer be a misconception of lies that we can sin and still be as Christ. Since the pastors Christ will send will feed us with the true knowledge and understanding to know the knowledge of the truth that we actually have to be as Christ is in this world. Can we read First John 3, verse 7 and 8, please? Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the son of Elohim was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Committing sin is the works of the devil, that Christ was manifested to destroy by turning us unto doing righteousness by faith, according to the law, to stop sinning, and giving heed or giving power to the devil. This is the truth and how we abide in Christ. First John 2 and 28, please. That right there is a clear distinction of being able to decipher between what's going on around you 
whether it be a false prophet, whether it be somebody with ill intent, whether it be a soothsayer, whether it be anything or a prophetess, no matter the case. Yeah. It says, He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil. It's just that simple. Yes, if sir. you want to know if a person is righteous, if they're keeping the law and bearing the fruits of the spirit, they're righteous. It's their actions. It's their deeds. It's not what they say. It's what they do. It said, he that doeth righteousness is righteous. It didn't say, he that speaketh righteousness is righteous. So you can... He that committeth sin, you have that's an act. Watch actions. Thank you. That's for sure. It definitely keeps away from the doctrines of the um the false prophets to entice us to any loss or to say we'll have peace even though we do evil. First John 2 and 28, whenever you're ready. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. It's essential. He refers to us as little children, so hopefully you already know, brothers and sisters, all this information is to help us simplify our life and be guileless and gentle. If we do the things that he's talking, we'll have that confidence and we won't be ashamed. When Christ does come, he will put many to shame at his coming because though we call upon him, he will tell us the truth that he never knew us because we continued in our iniquities doing the works of the devil. Can you read Matthew seven twenty-two to 23, please? Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, are we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. And in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. We see staying in iniquity won't get a relationship with Christ to know us. On the other hand, can we see what will? Matthew 7 and 21, please. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Just as Zechua was saying, it's about doing righteousness. It's about doing the will of the Father. It's not about saying, even saying, Lord, Lord. It's our heart has to actually be in it to show our hearts in it by our actions. So those who not only call him Lord, but actually do his Father's will in the commandments and the fruits of the Spirit will be those he knows because they came out of their iniquities by obeying the law. With that in mind, knowing that Christ is truly righteous and separate from sinners, John encouraged us on what we should do. First John 2 and 29, please. If ye know that he is righteous, ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. Actions, actions, actions. There will be no shame at the appearing of Christ for those men and women who believe the pastors that he will send to help everyone grow. And the men will be converted unto the faith to grow themselves and save their families by setting an example of a believer by overcoming themselves. This will all be Allah Hayim's doing for us to know that he is Allah Hayim. For we're not competing with one another, seeing there's no first places with Allah Hayim, but instead competing with ourselves to become stronger in faith and deeds to stand in Allah Hayim. Hey, 
Ezekiel 34 and 30 to 31, please. Thus shall they know that I, Ahia, their Elohim, am with them, and that they, even the house of Israel, are my people, saith the Lord Ahia. And ye, my flock, the flock of my pasture, are men, and I am your Elohim, saith the Lord Ahia. So it's interesting that. Everything that's about to come, uh, I am setting up his servant David, that root of Jesse, of the posterity of David, by Christ in him, to be a shepherd and guide the sheep, and having Levi and Judah there, to be their pastors and feed them so that they can walk upright. It's it's Elohim's doing, and it's all for us to know that he's actually with us. All right, and then it's not for the Jews only, because remember the mystery of the Gentiles are grafted in, so the household of Elohim of all nations will be delivered, starting with the men getting it together. As for the children of Israel, the household will be cleansed to walk uprightly in the fruits of the spirit before the grace period ends, and they go back under the rod of the judgments of death for sins worthy of death in the law when they are in the wilderness in these end times. Isaiah 4, verse 5 and 6, please. And Ahiah will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion, and upon her assemblies a cloud and a smoke by day, and the shining of a flame and fire by night. For upon all the glory shall be a defense. And there shall be a tabernacle for a shadow in the daytime from the heat, and for a place of refuge, and for a covert from storm and from rain. The pillar and cloud as Israel will be back in the wilderness again in the end times here to come, as we discussed in prior lessons. Uh, can you read Isaiah 4, verse 2 to 4, please? And that day shall the branch of Ahiah be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. This here is speaking of the true men of Israel, who are circumcised of heart to obey the faith, will be fruitful in good works. Continue, please. And it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion, and he that remaineth in Jerusalem, shall be called holy, even every one that is written among the living in Jerusalem. They will be holy men, having overcome and purged their households through submitting themselves to the law of Allah, so that their women may be saved by the Lord's work in them. Continue, please. When the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion. Now, how will the Lord Christ wash the filth of being laden with sins and diverse lusts from his daughters? Can you read Ephesians 5, verse 26, please? That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. So, just as he cleansed his own wife, it's the water of the word that he will use to sanctify and cleanse his daughters. Yet, they have to submit themselves to his word, understanding it's what they must do to be led by Christ through their head, the man, for their cleansing. For the women must know they need cleaning and have need of water, not feeling they're cleansed already. Ephesians 5 and 24, please. Therefore, if the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. That's important to understand, sisters, because your head, whether father, husband, or minister, is there for your saving, just as Christ is for the church. Verse 23, please. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. So being washed by the water of the word, taught by their men through Christ in them, will cleanse the daughters of Zion. And they will no longer be struggling with diverse lusts from their cleaving unto their men to rule over them with the word of Allah I am strengthening them to fulfill that law. Then, when they get right, 
their behavior will convert folks without the word, as women aren't suffered to teach, but their teaching is truly shown in their walk and manner of living. Can you read First Peter 3 and 1 and 2, please? Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. This chaste woman walking in the fear of the Lord to submit to her husband like the church does to Christ will win folks over as she stands out in a world where amongst Israel, women are ruling over their men in transgression against Allah Whereas she is setting that example of submitting to her own husband in all things, fulfilling the commandments of Allah Hayim. The scriptures show folks will see the work of Allah Hayim in a family when they see a woman walking in the fruits of the spirit. We have the women's series touching on the importance of women and the power a woman actually holds to help save and lead people astray. What we Getting touching a bit on it here and this, but please reference that women's playlist for further edification. Let's see how people can see the fruit of Allah Hayyam in how a woman operates. Sirach 36 and 23, please. If there be kindness, meekness, and comfort in her tongue, then it's not her husband like other men. Folks can't help but notice what Allah Hayyam is doing. And truly, that woman who, by her faith and obedience to the word, is acting like a virtuous woman in the world, they'll see that something's going on with that household. Her husband is not like other men. And you see how it'll bring them from, they'll be, they haven't heard the word or they didn't believe it, but that'll win them over to want to learn more. Continue in uh, Proverbs 31 and 26, please. She opened her mouth with wisdom. And her tongue is the law of kindness. Her talk is in the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, with her in mind to let all her speech be in kindness. Continue, please. The law of kindness is the fruit of the Spirit. Amen. Uh, she looketh well to the ways of her household. There we see the end product of the man getting in Christ truly, then helping his woman by Christ in him, washing his woman by the word. The woman, just like the Holy Spirit, would be looking well to the household of Allah Hayim, to teach and guide it in the ways of the Father. This virtuous woman would guide her household well. So now, how is this sister going to be talking with the fruits of the Spirit and in the fruits of the Spirit, submitting to the man to grow in the knowledge of the truth and operating like the Holy Spirit in her life and in her household. How is this going to be? Can you continue, please? And eateth not the bread of idleness. Hmm. Let's look at this and understand. Remember Faith was that woman with the strong hands and plowing forward, not looking back. So this virtuous woman has to put on faith to work hard at changing, which comes with the spirit of power to change when we aren't idle or lazy to do the work we need to do, implementing the laws in our life. That virtuous woman will be walking in the spirit of that woman faith to accomplish all this righteousness as a virtuous woman. And as she works, she will put on more good spirits too. Can you read verse 25 of Proverbs 31, please? Mm -hmm. Can I? I don't want to touch on something for you. Go on. Mm -hmm. okay, go ahead, then, buddy. <laughs> Got country on you. <laughs> Funny. Um, when you said that she can't be idle or lazy to do the work, it's the, the interesting thing with idleness or laziness is that a person isn't always idle or lazy. Nobody is just completely idle or lazy. It's just they're 
idle or lazy in the things that they're not really interested in. So the the thing that the struggle is, is that they're lazy to do good works. Yes. So when it says that Allah laws uh, are not grievous, if I was idle to, to do the law or to implement it, it's another sign that it shows that the law is actually grievous to me because I'm not quick to do it. I'm lazy to do it. I put it on the back burner. I cast it away from me. I omit it. And that's what causes the laziness or the idleness. Where she eateth not the bread of idleness because you actually consuming it. You're consuming it because it's, it's, <laughs> you're consuming the idleness because it's not what you want. So I would rather consume the idleness than actually go and put forth the work and labor to do something that's good according to Allah Hayyam. Because it's not good to me. The bread of idleness is good to me. So I'm going to stay away from that that I don't want to do. Mm. And, you know, the scriptures uses being fat with pride, right? That's kind of synonymous. Instead of sitting back and eating bread, if you sit there and eat a whole bunch of bread, it's going to fatten you up. Yes, it is. But if you out plowing <laughs> by faith, but then work, you ain't got time to sit down and be lazy. You're right. going to get in shape. You're going to get seasoned through experience, through the exercising of the word. Because you're working. Right. And eventually you're going to eat less bread because you're going to be in better shape. Yeah. You know how it is. Even yeah. for us, when we're in good shape, we don't eat as much as when we're idle. Yep. And there's a precept about that too. It's interesting how it all ties back to spiritual things. In Sirach 31 and 18, a very little is sufficient for a man well nurtured. Mm. So the more we get closer to Allah Hayyam, the more content we are. It's teaching us to come out of covetousness. It shows us what's actually filling us. It's not the bread. It's actually Allah Hayyam. The true bread. <laughs> right. <laughs> the manna that came down from heaven. Allah Hayyam, man. So the more we work, the more we work righteousness, the closer we are with Allah Hayyam. That's good for us all. Seek after the kingdom and his righteousness. And we shall be filled. Did you have anything else there? No, I'm ready. Okay. Let's see what, as the sister puts in that work, she presses forward, what other spirits she'll put on. In Proverbs 31 and 25, please. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. All right, let's learn about this strength and honor. Strength is H 5797. It means strength in various applications force, security, majesty, praise, boldness, loud, might, power, strength, strong. Now, we have 
one of the 12 virgins of the Holy Spirit. Specifically, the spirit of power clothing this virtuous woman to change, seeing the fruits of walking in faith. That woman called faith to be exact, to put the work in and power away at changing. And to add scripture insight, continence follows after faith because the woman faith she strengthens a person to believe that if they keep themselves from all evil, they can be saved. And that helps to strengthen a, the woman onto the spirit of countenance. And as you keep from all evil, the spirit of power is going to strengthen you to change and become a new creature, become a different person than you were. So, starting with faith, starting with changing your mindset. And believing you can actually do it. And believing it's possible. And starting to work at it. Wherever you have to start. With whatever commandment you got to start with. You just got to take a step. That's what he said. Faith is at the grain of a mustard seed. A mustard seed is the smallest of the seeds. It takes one step in the right direction. And you start the process. Yeah. And then there's a spirit, honor. Let's learn about honor in H1926. It means magnificence. That is, ornament or splendor, beauty, comeliness, excellency, glorious, glory, goodly, honor, majesty. So this woman, as she does these things, she'll be clothed with the glory of the Holy Spirit. And there is a reward that comes with that. In that, she will rejoice in the kingdom of the everlasting Father, Yahweh Christ, to come, not being ashamed at his coming, because she fulfilled his command to be perfect in love, doing the will of the Holy Father, Ahaya Alahayim. So, it's good to understand what the Lord Yahweh will do, and how he will do it, and what will be the results of it to know. We are on the right track in understanding and perspective to be perfect. The Lord will purge the whole nation by the spirits of judgment and burning in that fiery trial of the Holy Spirit, tormenting us with her discipline and trying us by her laws to get us to the place where she can trust our souls and make us new creatures when she enters into us. And can you read Isaiah, the rest of chapter 4, verse 4, please? And shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. There we see all the children of Jerusalem, which is above, and the mother of us all will be purged by the baptism of fire through the Holy Spirit, tormenting them with her discipline to obey Allah voice. And then after they are able to do so, she will try them by her laws and the fruits of her spirit, so that she may be able to trust their souls. When they've come out of the struggle with listening and operating according to evil spirits and doctrines of devils. Now, just a note for the sisters and brothers. A wife is to be subject to her own husband. Yet, if her husband is a foolish fellow, like Nabal, Abigail's husband, or Magdonia's husband in the Acts of Thomas, you have to use wisdom and not make yourself an underling to a foolish fellow or your reverence for that man to cause you to fall by partaking in his sins, enabling him in his sins, or covering his sins for him to be able to continue in them, or sinning yourself for his sake, being a respect of persons or man pleaser. Can you read Sirach 4 verse 22 and 27, please? Except no person against thy soul. And let not the reverence of any man cause thee to fall. Make not thyself an underling to a foolish man, neither accept the person of the mighty. So hopefully that helps for sisters and vice versa for men. Don't make yourself an underling to a foolish fellow or accept any man's person to cause you to sin. 
because as you know, we talked about teachers that aren't teaching the right things. You have to want to see it, focus on keeping the law yourself so that Allah will open your understanding to see whether your teachers who you should be following or not. And uh, both brothers and sisters, I would suggest to be sure you're in Allah Hayim's counsel. Pray about your teachers and look for an answer. He speaks by dreams and visions. And make sure you're following the right people because it's important. Now, the I'll brothers... I'll say one thing, oh. Kasim. Mm -hmm. I'll say one thing. If you're vigilant of the fruits of the Spirit, that's going to tell you a lot because it's very hard to hide the works of the flesh. And if you're not keeping the commandments at some point, it's going to show forth in your conduct. Thank you. So really just being vigilant of the fruits of the spirit and the works of the flesh and that'll tell you. Would you add how a person reacts to correction as well? It's the same fruits of the spirit. Yes. Thank you. No. <clears throat> Was there anything else? No, no, I'm ready. Okay. Now, vice versa for men. Don't enable your wives by letting her have her own way to continue in her faults. But by love without being bitter, speak words of righteousness in due season and hold her accountable, not letting her have her way to think it's okay to continue going in the wrong direction. Leviticus 19 and 17, please. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. And that's for both brothers and sisters. Love your spouse and hold them accountable to the faith, not suffering sin upon them by not saying anything to help them in love. Also, check back on the lesson, walking in wisdom in our relationships to know when out of love, you have to separate from that person for their own salvation as well to bring them to repentance so you can receive them back in truth. So we're not saying to obey an unbelieving man to your own detriment or be in a relationship as a codependent where you're supporting or enabling a person's transgression instead of helping them change. Okay. Again, reference that narcissist lesson. It's that's another come to find out that's a prerequisite to this lesson to understand a lot of the things that's being discussed and such here. <sighs> but then the same thing when it said that they would um they would use the law. This is the case where a lot of times they will make up something that you done. Or they would manipulate a situation that you've done or that you were a part of. Though it may not be the truth, they will lie and manipulate the situation and change it and gaslight the situation. Where they may be rebuking you for something that wasn't necessarily true. It's interesting. Just really, you really have to cleave unto Allah in different scenarios of what may come to you because um, really just holding on to the truth you know so it's interesting scenarios but all in all Allah knows all and he's the judge so you have to make sure that you do what's right and hold yourself accountable no matter if another person is holding themselves accountable or not you're still responsible for yourself and that's, at the end of the day, that's the most important thing. Amen. Thank you. Amen. All right. So we see there is deliverance to come. Allah is going to be, going to exalt his name. And for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's sake, save his children in all the world of all nations. Let's get into talking about righteous parents. Now that we got some understanding of the deliverance to come for parents in the faith through faith in Yahshua Christ, let's look at how parenting and righteousness ought to be. Firstly, righteous parents walk in righteousness, obeying the commandments and ordinance themselves through the examples and the testimonies 
Can you read Luke chapter 1, verse 5 and 6, please? There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abia. And his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before Elohim, walking in all the commandments and the ordinances of the Lord blameless. So we see, as John said, he that's righteous is righteous even as he is righteous, right? Mm -hmm. They were to be righteous, they were walking in the commandments and the ordinances, blameless. So there we are, have an example of a righteous couple, both walking in the commandments and the ordinances blamelessly for a scriptural example of what a righteous couple looks like. You see it's actions, 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 okay? Now, in our work to become righteous parents, we have to start with being just by focusing on doing what's right and confessing when we fall in a learning experience and getting back up and continuing our plowing. Can you read Proverbs 24 and 16, please? For a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. Isn't it interesting with the plowing, right? The just falleth and getteth back up and gets back to work, right? Mm -hmm. But if isn't it interesting how in, it's commonly known today a symptom of depression is binge eating? Or you go eat to, I may have said the wrong term. Is that eating where to feel better, you go eat a bunch of food? Mm-hmm where the bread of idleness that's what i was getting at you can mm -hmm. see how the scripture is showing the spirits behind the stuff you know being just we're going to have experiences to learn but we have to not get idle to go sit down and get out of the race but okay i tripped over that hurdle now i know to watch out for that hurdle on the next round and continue running continue pressing forward you want to know the interesting part about what you just brought up? It says, For a just man falleth seven times and rises up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. It shows the intent of the heart. Because if I do something and I fall at doing it, and I go and I start eating the bread of idleness and I get sorrowful, because it didn't work out for me. I didn't truly desire it. I just wanted it to come to me easily. And because it didn't come to me easily, I'm discouraged and I'm sorrowful. So I'm like, I don't want to do it at all. I'm going to go eat the bread of idleness because I didn't want to do it in the first place. Yeah. Whereas the just man actually wanted to do it he had a desire to do it he just failed because he wasn't experienced enough but he rose up again because he's like okay i learned my lesson on that one now i know what not to fall in okay i fell again but i fell in a different place now i know not to fall there either until the point that he gets to the place where he doesn't fall at all because through his experiences and actually um what's the word um the deity um investigating the deity investigating the deity he actually learned through his experiences that it does work you just have to understand it you have to understand the the forces or the works that are against you to be able but to walk and avoid them. You have to be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. You actually have to have wisdom to understand what's working against you. So in doing that, in gaining that experience and in investigating the deity to understand that the law actually does work and how to utilize the law to then stay out of the iniquity or not to fall. Is actually through the experience. So because he desired it or she desired it truly, 
you will rise back up and you wouldn't go into sorrow or into idleness. Man. John was speaking to little children and we've seen what little children do to learn to walk. They get up and keep going. But they sincerely want to walk. Yeah. They want, they really want to walk. <laughs> <laughs> They're just not content with sitting on the floor. Yeah. Good perspective. Good insight so we can know ourselves and know what's going on when we're tempted to sit down and not get back up. Or to get into sorrow. Right. Get into idleness. Let's not be wicked to get into the mischief of sorrow and doubt that we can change when we fall because it would lead us to add sin upon sin. Can you read Psalms of Solomon chapter 3 verse 7 and 8 please? The steadfastness of the righteous is from Elohim, the deliverer. There lodgeth not in the house of the righteous sin upon sin. The righteous continually search of his house to remove utterly all iniquity done by him in error. See the righteous focus and way of thinking and acting to overcome the struggle. The righteous man doesn't give in to that sorrow or doubt as he's learning, but praises Allah for showing the fault to grow from, and he gets back up like we're talking about and continues learning, continues working. Continue, please. The righteous stumbleth and holdeth a higher righteous. He falleth and looketh out for what Allah would do to him. So he doesn't judge or condemn himself either, but trust what Allah rewards him with will be for his deliverance. And that's an amazing mindset if you can implement it. To know whatever you bring, even though it's called a punishment, is actually to help me. And it's to help me get better. It's to deliver me from whatever I've been doing. Right? And even to hold on to that. Like, if you make a mistake, don't sit there and beat yourself up. Pray and ask forgiveness. Say, Allah, I am, you know, I've, 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 fought, I've, I've faltered. Uh, I, you know, I repent for and speak out exactly what you did and say, hey, Allah, I am, you're, you're the judge, you know, doing to me as you see fit. And, and continue walking from there. And if Allah, I am, brings something upon you, then he's righteous. But don't sit there and beat yourself down. Just continue walking, you know, and, and putting forth the, and using the experiences to help you walk, you know. Amen. Thank you. Continue when you're ready. He seeketh out whence his deliverance will come. He views even his punishment looking for deliverance from his iniquity in it. And we hope that helps in knowing how we can be righteous and just in the midst of growing to be blameless. All right. Um, any anything else on that, Zachar? I'm sorry, I was yawning. No, I'm good. It's all good. <sighs> Parents who come into the faith have patience and an honest and good heart to bring forth the fruits of the law, listening in humility and implementing the laws to grow themselves and taking their time and being patient with themselves as we see to get back up and keep walking until it becomes a normal way of life. Luke 8 and 15, please. But that on the good ground are they, which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it, and bring forth fruit with patience. Have patience with ourselves and be honest with our true selves, catching the lies so as not to hinder from speaking the truth in our heart to bring forth fruit. Take the growing pains in stride and keep building towards righteousness as a just person gets back up to continue plowing. Just confess that fall and get up and keep working to forsake that mistake and get mercy from Allah 
that he gives because Elohim gives grace for the learning curves or the learning experiences we have to go through to get to where he needs us to be. Proverbs 28 and 13, please. Whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Amen. That's essential. Gotta confess and forsake our errors. All right. <clears throat> it makes it easier when you look at it in the perspective that you're breaking bad habits. Instead of looking at it like I'm um, I'm failing because I can't get it right. It's no, I'm breaking bad habits right now. Because we've inherited um, many bad habits that are against the law. Or we've inherited sin through our upbringings, through our experiences, through our ways of dealing with things that may have happened to us. We may implement it, bad things that that we use to cope. But essentially, we learn bad habits that are against the commandments that cause us to sin. So if you keep it in the perspective like, hey, I'm breaking bad habits because it's interesting, the perspective of breaking a bad habit is in a good light. But the perspective of doing right not to sin comes with a bad light in, in, in many instances when it comes to people. So just having the perspective, because with breaking bad habits, we know that it takes time. It's, it's according to the standard of the world, breaking bad habits takes time. It just doesn't happen overnight but for some odd reason when it comes to sinning and it comes to not sinning we look at it as it's supposed to be this miraculous thing and not something that happens over a process of time like breaking bad habits so if we actually have that perspective that hey i'm breaking bad habits you will have more compassion and more mercy and more patience upon yourself. That was a good perspective. That was great. Great insight, great outlook. Are you finished? Amen. I'm good. Amen. Thank you. All right. Now let's jump into parenting and righteousness. We touched on how a parent ought to get themselves together and put the work in. Let's look at how they should operate in there with their children. Let's see how righteous parents raise their kids. Righteous parents not only do good themselves, working to overcome patience with themselves and one another in an honest and good heart, but they teach the good too so that they aren't hypocrites. They make sure they're raising their kids according to the law and walking in it themselves. Can you read Susanna, chapter 1, verse 3, please? Her parents also were righteous. So they were examples, okay. And taught their daughter according to the law of Moses. And they taught their child according to the law, so she could be an example. That's the standard for parents and parenting in general. It's to do right and walk in the same patience with their children, teaching them according to the law, so that they may be raised up in the right way to go and not depart from it all the days of their life. It's essential for parents to obey the voice of Allah Hayyam outlined in his law, and to teach their kids according to his words, because walking in this fear of the Lord will establish authority for the parents from Allah Hayyam over their children, through his spirit protecting the family and keeping them from the dominion of evil spirits. Can you read Sirach 10 and 21, please? The fear of the Lord goeth before the obtaining of authority, but roughness and pride is the losing thereof. And you hopefully can already see two different spirits battling in this verse. The fear of Allah, him and his spirits, is going to bring authority. 
roughness and pride, the works of the devil, the lust of the flesh, is going to cause it to be lost. When we get into spiritual fornication and start operating in, in the evil spirits of hatred, anger, wrath, or envy, they'll lead to roughness in the spirit of pride itself, which operates in roughness as well. Then from that, the devil will have place, and his spirits will take dominion, influencing the family to turn away from Alahayam onto confusion and dysfunctional behaviors. As Zakwa mentioned, we inherited some things that weren't good. You see how the spirits we walk in, it gave the devil place to turn the family upside down from the will of Alahayam. And you can see the results of doing evil as a parent's effect on the family by what happened to Judah, who lost his authority because of his errors, giving evil spirits place that his wife didn't honor him, nor his two sons, nor would they listen to him, which led to Judah being afflicted from the bad environment and the death of his wife, and those two kids eventually died as well. Likewise, David lost children through his learning experiences to help confirm the importance of doing right to get help from Allah Hayyam for our families. Likewise, a sister upholding the faith can save her husband and children like Zipporah who saved Moses and their son by her good works to keep the law. Mind you, just because a parent does right, it doesn't always mean a child will too. As Samuel's sons, they were evil, and David's son, Amnon, did evil before David had fell. Yet, by doing right, you can help do your part as a parent to give them that example to follow and return unto if they go astray to learn what they need to to become humble and then return in humility like the prodigal son. Also, an unbelieving parent doesn't always mean a child will stay in the works of unbelief. Like Abram, whose father was an idolater, and Zipporah, who both chose the right way, though their fathers were struggling with idolatry. Or a son who sees the works of his father and chooses to do right, as Ahia spake of in Ezekiel chapter 18. So, there are variables according to Allah Hayim's will. Yet, all in all, the right thing for parents to do is to uphold the faith, starting with the men to maintain the authority of their roles in a household through Allah Hayim, or else the devil's spirit will find place to create strife and grudges in the household. In the fear of Ahaya, the authority Ahaya gives in the household is as follows. Sirach 3 and 2, please. For the Lord hath given the father honor over the children. Notice, it's Ahaya who gives it. And that man gets that honor, spending time to get wisdom in the fear of Ahaya, humbling himself to the process of doing the law and the fruits of the Spirit to get the Holy Spirit. Proverbs 15 and 33, please. The fear of Ahia is the instruction of wisdom. We know wisdom herself instructs in the fear of Ahia. So we know the Holy Spirit is instructing us if we are implementing the laws and the fruits of it to submit ourselves to them. Continue, please. And before honor is humility. A humble man will have honor in his house from Malahayim in the end, as he will endure the process in patience with a good heart to bring forth fruit. I want to add, he will do that doing whatever Malahayim instructs to do because he's dwelling according to the knowledge of the law. Okay? Remember, Roughness and pride, it will cause one to lose authority that al desires to give a man. And we see it's because he got lifted up instead of being humble to be upheld in honor by the precepts. Can you read Proverbs 29 and 3, please? A man's pride shall bring him low, 
but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. Um, if we looked at that definition or a definition of the word honor, this he was talking about that glory and majesty from Malahayim, his spirit. So men, humility, humbleness, and long suffering is a focal point for us in our growth in the fear of Malahayim, and it will reap benefits in our household from Malahayim doing his work in us and within the household. All right. Hopefully that helps for exhortation. Now let's see what Allah Hayyam gives a mother. So the rest of Sirach 3 and 2, please. Uh, Kasa, real quick. The, the fear of the Lord is humility. If you want hey, to man. touch on that. I've seen you going into all these humility scriptures. But I didn't see you tie that. The fear of the Lord goeth before the obtaining of authority. Touch on it, please. I didn't look for a precept while you do that. The fear of the Lord goes before the obtaining of authority because the fear of the Lord is when you're is the humility process. So that's when you're actually humbling yourself to actually be under Allah. So that's why the fear of the Lord goes before. So you have to be humbled and you have to be brought to a place where you can be taught and actually you actually will follow and be obedient before the obtaining of authority where you actually are walking in it with confidence and boldness. Amen. Sirach 2 and 17, they that fear the Lord will prepare their hearts and humble their souls in his sight. So we have to do that <laughs> in order to be built up. Amen. Thank you. Good catch. That's good for all of us because we all got to know what the fear of the Lord is and what it takes <laughs> that should be in it. Humility. Let's see what Allah gives a mother in the house and the rest of Sirach 3 and 2, please. I have confirmed the authority of the mother over the sons. All right. So from Allah the man has honor over his children, while the mother has authority over the sons in their youth to guide them in the instructions of the Lord according to what her husband taught her as she learns from him at home according to 1 Corinthians 14 and 35. Of course, a sister with an unbelieving husband like Lois, Timothy's mother, would teach her son as she learns from the ministers of Allah just like Lois brought up her son under Paul who, by preaching unto him and guiding him in righteousness, as a father ought to do, begot him in spirit through Christ, and the word preached. So that's why he spake of Timothy as his own son in the faith, being that father figure in the faith for him. All right. Touching back on a mother's authority over her sons. Remember, that authority comes by her being in the Lord, walking in his fear but not that spirit of humility. But if she isn't doing right, she can lose it through her roughness and pride as Allah holds us accountable to do right. In some cases, when a mother isn't doing right, Allah can remove her altogether too as a scorn is cast out so that strife and reproach would cease. You have Ishmael's wife, for example, in the book of Jasher, who was put away for her ill dealings of reproaching her husband, cursing and beating her children, and dishonoring her father-in-law. Those are characteristics of a woman who is truly not in the Lord, but struggling with evil spirits, unfortunately. Now, in regards to a mother who is in the Lord, operating like the Holy Spirit and what she teaches the good works a mother teaching her children according to what her husband taught her helps her guide the house, and it gives the adversary no occasion to speak reproachfully as she is upholding the doctrine of Allah in her doings. Can you read First Timothy 5 and 14, please? I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. All right, 
Titus chapter 2, verse 4 and 5, please. That they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chast, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of Allah be not blasphemed. Good mothers are essential to the household, as a wise or foolish woman can make all the difference in the house, whether to blaspheme Allah Hayyam and give the devil occasion to speak reproachfully, or to glorify Allah Hayyam by good works and obeying his law, and to put the adversary to silence by her goodness. Can you read Proverbs 14 and 1, please? Every wise woman buildeth her house. Her husband guiding her as the Holy Spirit has wisdom from the Father. She builds up the children in Allah Hayyam's instruction so that they may not depart when they grow up. Continue, please. But the foolish plucketh it down with her hands. The unbeliever will tear the family down with her hands, which is her works for her actions, just as Judah's wife did. By not being in agreement with her husband to guide her children or to honor their father, to obey him, because she had her own desires, her perception of what was right, which she preferred to fulfill. Now, mind you, the sons still have their own choice to make, to listen to their father or not, regardless of how their mother operates and vice versa. If the mother is teaching right, though the father is not upholding the law, as Timothy did, following his mom and his grandma, though his father didn't circumcise him. So you can see, everybody has a choice to make. Everybody has their own accountability. Can you read Proverbs 13 and 1, please? A wise son heareth his father's instruction, but a scorner heareth not rebuke. A wise son will continue listening to his father's instruction when it's according to the law. And he would not forsake the laws on the manner of how to do what his father commanded that his mother had taught him when he was a child and how to operate in the fruits of the spirit, nor her exhortations unto the good as a young man. Can you read Proverbs 1 and 8, please? My son, hear the instructions of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. Hear your father's instructions when he gives them, and remember the laws your mother gave you to understand and apply what your father instructed you. Proverbs 16 and 21. Bind them continually upon thy heart, and tie them about thy neck. Proverbs 1 and 9. For they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head, and chains about thy neck. Proverbs 6 and 22. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. And when thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. The law, it's spiritual, and the words of Christ are spirit, so they come to our aid in our day and our sleep to help us stay in the light of it. Proverbs 6 and 23 and 24, please. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. Confirming righteous parents teach their children according to the law, so they may have it for light to guide them in their thoughts, actions, and lives, reproving and instructing them unto good works as a way of life. Continue, please. Keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. So being trained up in the spiritual law and the fruits of the Spirit keeps from the twelve evil women in black who are evil spirits and the flattery of the tongue of these strange women enticing us to sin in our thoughts that lead us unto sin in our actions when the lust is conceived in our minds. Let's touch on who these strange women are. Hermas, parable 9, chapter 15, verse 3, please. Here, saith he, <clears throat> Likewise, the names of the women that wear the black garments. Of these also, four are more powerful than the rest. The first is unbelief. The second, intemperance. The third, disobedience. The fourth, deceit. 
and there follows a cause, sadness, wickedness, wantonness, irascibility, falsehood, folly, slander, hatred. The servant of Elohim that bear these names shall see the kingdom of Elohim, but shall not enter into it. So you see, we can learn, we can see what the right thing is, we can see how to get to the kingdom, but if we're clothed with any of these strange women, their works are found in us, we won't be able to enter. A man gives his mind to these spirits by the pleasure they give to him, being deceived by the untrue perspectives they give with flattering speech to make him arrogant in a heightened sense of self-importance to be self-pleasing, to give in to the strange woman's words to error from the law of Allah. It's interesting. It's like these women are some of them seducing spirits that Paul was talking about. Same spirits, man. <laughs> It's important to take heed to the teachings of righteous parents because even men who have believed and walked in the fruits have been deceived by the desire of these evil spirits. Let's look at it. In um, Hermes Parable 9, chapter 13, verse 7 and 8, please. These all, saith he, receive the name of the Son of Elohim and receive likewise the power of these virgins. We see here, People can receive the name of Yache and keep his law, receiving the power of the virgins. All right? Continue, please. When then they receive these spirits. These spirits are the daughters of the Holy Spirit, known as the virgins. All right? They were strengthened and were with the servants of Allah. And they had one spirit and one body and one garment, for they had the same mind and they wrought righteousness. That's the evidence in scripture of what receiving the true name Yache and walking in the fruits of the spirit do in work in righteousness, being of the same mind and spirit in one body under the same sound doctrine, having Allah and his spirits in all our thoughts to instruct us. Yet, that doesn't mean the journey is over once we get to that place of actually being in the truth. Can you continue, please? After a certain time, then, they were persuaded by the women whom thou sawest clad in black raiment, from having their shoulders bare and their hair loose and beautiful in form. There we see the flattery of a strange woman coming into our thoughts to change our perception of right and wrong, to view their strange works as something to be desired and worth partaking in. Continue, please. When they saw them, they desired them. We listen to these idols, and they turn us from keeping our eyes on Allah to look upon them, to see their ways as what feels right, though it isn't truly right. Continue, please. And they clothe themselves with their power. Then we act on their perspective and operate in the power of evil spirits after we had been persuaded in our minds to see things with an unlawful perspective or perception. Continue, please. But they stripped off from themselves the power of the virgins. As Paul said, there is no concord between Christ and Belier, so we can't give into the power of evil women and still have the power of the fruits of the Spirit, as Allah and his spirits aren't unequally yoked with unbelievers. So we can't be lukewarm in partiality. We have to be mindful to take our time to catch the lies in our minds and seek after the judgments of Allah in our thoughts so that his spirits will be the only ones that persuade us so we can be led unto good works. Seeing the spirits at work for good and evil, our mind and what we give heed to listen to and give into is important. So that means our listening skills are important to develop. A son, or any person for that matter, has to be willing to listen, to be taught, and apply their mind to what they hear to become prudent, being instructed out of the law. 
Can you read Sirach 6, verse 32 and 33, please? My son, if thou wilt, thou shalt be taught. And if thou wilt apply thy mind, thou shalt be prudent. If thou love to hear, thou shalt receive understanding. And if thou bow down thine ear, thou shalt be wise. So, <clears throat> it takes application of the mind, reasoning, and implementing the things we hear. But it doesn't stop there, as we have to have a love for hearing to receive understanding. Yet, that love for listening has to be in humility, bowing our ears, wanting to listen genuinely for our growth in obedience. As we touched on earlier, a person could be listening and learning for the desire to manipulate or deceive or to exalt themselves. So intent of listening, intent is very important as well. Okay. All right. Zachua, can you read Proverbs 19 and 20, please? Hear counsel and receive instruction that thou mayest be wise in the latter end. It's interesting. It's like everything's coming together here. Hearing the counsel and receiving the instructions of the law will lead to wisdom, as we will become knowledgeable in Elohim's will. And he said that thou must be wise in thy latter end. Zachary, you had mentioned how faith is as a mustard seed. Just take that small step. Start. Begin. Do take that step forward and we get further understanding here listening to counsel and instruction is a part of that step so it's going to benefit us in the latter end of what we're endeavoring on and let's get preset for where we are to get our instructions from to make sure we're in the right way Romans 2 and 18 please and know it's his will and approve the things that are more excellent being instructed out of the law so a child ought to listen and obey righteous parents who are teaching according to the law so that he may go in the right direction and not depart from it. And when he is a man, he ought not to forsake the law of his mother, that she had taught him in his youth, nor her exhortations unto good in his adulthood, and continue to listen to his father's instructions that he may prosper by the light of the law in his everyday life. You have... Joseph is a good example. What his father taught him as a young man to keep himself securely from a strange woman helped him in his life when he got in, when he went into Egypt. You remember he talked about that in Joseph and Asenath, how I kept my father's commandments before me and I didn't listen to her. Moses too, actually, when he went to um, Kikanis, to um, Ethiopia, he remembered the commands of Abraham to Isaac, not to... um marry a stranger so can you read Ephesians 6 and 1 please children obey your parents in the Lord for this is right if your parents are in the Lord serving Ahayala Hayim and Lord Yache obey them because it's right to do let's understand who a parent in the Lord is as a hearer or a talker of what is good but not actually doing it themselves is a hypocrite by scripture, not someone that is in the Lord, because the Lord is not in fellowship with Belier. So let's be sure we know who a parent in the Lord is to hold ourselves to the standard of Christ. Can you read Romans 2 and 13, please? For not the hearers of the law are just before Elohim, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Thank you, brother. You're welcome. A parent in the Lord is a doer of the law that has the ability to see clearly to help his child because he put the work in to submit himself to the law before trying to teach another. And that's an important step because we need that experience to know what it's like and what it takes to actually overcome to be able to genuinely teach somebody and also have that compassion for them to help them and be with them through the process. And you can't, it's tough to really do that without having gone through the process yourself. 
Yeah, you really don't know what it takes. I mean, it's just like going to college and getting the book answers, but then when you go actually into the field, it's completely different. You can quote all the scriptures you want, but if you don't have the experience of the scriptures to tell me how to correctly apply them, then it's for naught. It doesn't have any any weight. Amen. Can you read Polycarp to the Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, please? And teach ourselves first to walk according to the commandments of the Lord. A man can't hold his wife to a standard without living up to the standard himself. As we must first teach ourselves to walk according to the commandments before we can teach anyone else. Continue, please. And then your wives to walk likewise according to the faith that is given to them in charity and in purity, loving their own husbands with all sincerity and all others alike with all temperance. So, Elohim doesn't skip steps and we can't skip steps. We have to teach ourselves first and then we can teach our wives after a man starts walking in the commandments, he will bring forth the fruits of the faith, charity, and purity to be able to teach his wife those spirits and to love him in sincerity and others alike in temperance. He can also guide her to bring up the kids in truth when he is walking in it himself. Can you continue, please? And to bring up their children in the instruction and fear of the Lord. And there we see, parents in the Lord are not hypocrites, but actually doers of the law, that they may teach their family, because the parent in the Lord puts the work in to overcome their struggles, so they can see clearly to help their child. On the other hand, a hypocritical parent can struggle to see right towards their family, which leads to evil speaking. Can you read James chapter 4 verse 11, please? Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. Let's get into this here. A struggling parent can exalt themselves to judge by looking at things according to what's right to them, being hard on their child for not doing what's right in their own eyes because. They are overcompensating for their own shortcomings by being hard on their kids or holding them to a high standard that they themselves do not uphold. In this struggle, they will speak evil of their kids, but their judgment isn't always right as they themselves have things to overcome to help them see clearly to help the kids. And elaborate on anything if you need to, please. Yes, um many many parents fall into the shortcoming of of having their own standard of righteousness and having their own standard of what's right instead of holding themselves to the standard of Elohim themselves so that hypocrisy really is big for many parents where they feel like they can't be wrong neither do they confess their own faults and that makes it hard for them to be believing parents, according to Allah Hayyam, because a believing parent would have the fear of the Lord and be humble and be able to confess their fault or when they make a mistake or when they're not correct, even when it comes to their children. Amen. Amen. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. So here's the difference between a parent in the Lord that we ought to obey in all things because they are doers of the law who can see clearly to counsel us as opposed to a parent who is not in the Lord truly by evidence of their struggle to keep the commandments or continuous in hypocrisy requiring others to uphold the laws 
but not doing it themselves. In that struggle, they will make themselves judges of the law, being critical of others when it comes to the law, to hold them to a high standard that they don't hold themselves to or that they don't live up to themselves. Um, for them to be a judge of the law and not a doer of the law, that means that the spirit of pride is in the midst of them. So for a parent that's struggling with pride, they wouldn't be able to see their own fault and they will only be looking for a fault in you to lift themselves up above you or to exalt themselves. In turn, it wouldn't be the love of Elohim for them coming with a, a sincere heart to see you doing well in turn that pride with them being the judge would turn into hatred where they would actually not want to see you do well and that's where we have to understand the distinction of a parent in the lord and a parent not in the lord because a parent not in the lord has the the capacity or the capability of tearing you down or being against you because of the spirit of hatred at work in them in the spirit of pride so when that parent becomes a judge over you their righteousness or their way which can always change becomes the standard according to their own desire or their own profitableness of the situation so instead of the standard being set as Allah has set the standard, his law doesn't change, his fruits of the spirit his ordinances don't change, that parent being a judge, it would change according to their own desire or according to their own um, profitableness. Correct. Did you did you touch on a part about um how anger doesn't suffer us to see the face of anyone in truth. And no, um, I didn't touch on that. You can go into it. Okay. It can also happen why a parent would be a judge over their child in that like narcissism lesson talked about. A narcissist hates themselves. They're angry at who they are. So they push that out on others. And that parent, when they see their shortcomings in their children, it angers them. So they go hard on their children. Because they treat themselves like that too. So they hate themselves. So that can be a factor to look out for. So it's very important to know the standing of your parent in truth and really see your parent for their works and not their words so that you can actually understand how to operate amongst your parents still honoring them but at the same time not putting them before Allah and his law amen thank you Uh, was there anything else? No, go ahead, brother. I'm ready. Okay. We have to be mindful of God's parents who truly aren't in the Lord, unfortunately, because not everything they say to do may actually be right according to the Lord. So one has to be mindful of that possibility when our parents are not in, in the Lord truly. That parent that isn't truly in the Lord is likely to deal roughly and in pride to lose authority for a child to obey them in all things because they aren't walking in the fear of the Lord, though that child still ought to honor them and hold them in high regard as their parent. We touched on that in the um, honor your parents lesson as well on the law class. Now, you have Jonathan, the son of Saul, for example, whose father Saul 
was struggling as he was mentioning the Lord, but he wasn't doing right. He instructed Jonathan to bring David to kill him and even reviled Jonathan, being rough and prideful. But Jonathan didn't obey him, but entreated him to leave off from the wrong that he was walking in. That's an example of a child not just doing whatever their parents say when their parent isn't in the Lord and even trying to entreat their parent as a father, as you're supposed to entreat a father, giving him that respect and that honor. Okay. On the other hand, a parent in the Lord doing well can lead a child to be obedient. Like Judah, before he fell, he obeyed his father Jacob in everything and prospered because of his obedience. Right? Jacob doing right. It had an effect on his children. Okay? Now, mind you, parents, in both cases, children also have their own journey to walk out, whether we do right or not, as both Judah and and Amnon, David's son, made mistakes, but Judah came to repentance and grew in the faith from his experience, while Amnon, he didn't. So it shows even when we get to the place of doing right ourselves, we still have to have trust in Allah Hayim and be patient with the journey our kids have to go through for the furtherance of their faith, keeping a righteous discourse daily to help them overcome not bearing a grudge to be bitter with where they are or the choices they make because bearing that grudge works death as being frustrated with them will not bring forth fruits of the spirit. Hermas vision two, chapter three, verse one, please. But do thou Hermas no longer bear a grudge against thy children, neither suffer thy sister to have her way so that they may be purified from their former sins. For they shall be chastised with a righteous chastisement, unless thou bear a grudge against them thyself. The bearing of a grudge worketh death. Continue, please. But the great mercy of the Lord had pity on thee and thy family, and will strengthen thee and establish thee in his glory. Only be not thou careless, but take courage. And strengthen thy family, for as the smith hammering his work conquers the task which he wills, so also do his righteous discourse repeated daily conquer all evil. Cease not, therefore, to reprove thy children, for I know that if they shall repent with all their heart, they shall be written in the books of life with the saints. So hopefully that helps for um, guidance for parents and righteous discourse. Repeat it daily. Keep talking of right things and good things with your kids. And in the right spirit, because it has to be done in righteousness. And in the right time, there's the, the Lord speaks of how doing one rebuke with love is better than a thousand rebukes. To help. Mm. Have faith. Trust that Allah I will turn things around. And let whatever he brings is for the best. So we can stay in that trusting, temperate spirit, no matter what comes. Okay. Anything else on that, Zachwa? Um, Just encouragement. When dealing with children... Just really be the focus and the mindset of that you're preparing them to serve Allah in all things. And using every opportunity for a learning or teaching moment. Not getting frustrated, not taking things personally, um, not getting angry, but looking really working on yourself because a lot of times as parents you get to see the things that you need to work on through your children working on having that sincere and honest and good heart toward them wanting to see them do well speaking life into them speaking words of righteousness helping them being being um 
um, what's the word, uh, patient with them, um, taking the time to actually show them how to do things and not just thinking that they already should know how to do it. You know, it really teaches you to, to really be a shepherd, a good shepherd and a good steward to actually helping people. You know, so just be mindful that these are people that you're dealing with. Though they may be smaller, they're still people in Alhaim, the Alhaim's children. You know, being parents, you still have to, you have to respect your children too. You have to show forth that respect for them because you're teaching them the respect that they should give others by the respect that you give them and the way that you speak to them and the way that you deal with them. You're teaching them through your works and through your actions. So treat your children how you want them to treat other people. I'm done. Amen. Thank you, brother. That was essential what you talked about for brothers and sisters. Don't forget to reference that narcissist lesson because what Zach just talked about is essential to helping your child not develop the wrong outlook or getting involved in the wrong spirits in their life. Now in closing, when our parents are found in the fear of the Lord, humble, obedient to his commandments, and his fruits of the spirit, believing in the name Yache. This is what we ought to do. Colossians 3 and 20, please. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well pleasing unto the Lord. Obeying your parents are the in the Lord in all things is well pleasing to the Lord, because it's right to do, as they will instruct you to do the things that will please the Lord according to his law. So this was a lengthy discussion, it touched on a lot of things, a lot of needful things for foundational understanding and tying in things from before and also understanding for things we're going to talk about going forward. Thank you all for your time and patience and sticking this out with us. We hope this is edifying and we look forward to catch you on the next opportunity to continue building and understanding things for the family and our growth. Anything else, Brother Zachwa? I'm all good. Praise Allah. Right. Amen. Yeah, Jay Christ. Peace be with y'all. Challah. Challah. HRC, 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 HRC,